I just Thank realized you. we have negotiations till 5.30. It starts at 6.30 in Boston. So we'll, should we do a student council day first, and then we'll, okay. Then we'll start uh, student council working. recognitions first. Yeah, recognition okay. first, and then we'll go as far as student council. Are we, um, are we just about ready? Yes. Are you, are you ready? It's going to be a good day. Yes, it is. It's going to be a nice one. Okay, I think we're going to start in a second here. Are we good? Okay. Hello. And welcome to the Thursday, January 18th regular meeting of the Hawkington School Committee. I will ask that you stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Well, welcome. I will read through the agenda and then we will get down to business we're going to move some things around to accommodate some guests that we have in the audience um, we will start with recognitions followed by public comment we have uh, several reports to the school committee tonight we have a student council report superintendents report assistant superintendent search report school committee chair report liaison reports under new business we will be taking up the high school handbooks um, and looking at international travel requests for 2019. We will have our first reading of school committee policy EHB electronic records retention. And our first reading of school committee policy IJNDB internet acceptable use. Following that, we'll have a personnel request from Dr. Kavanaugh and um, a discussion of a baseball field memorial project um, by Ms. King. We have no items under old business tonight. We'll have our second opportunity for public comment after new business, and then uh, we will have items by consensus, and it's our goal to adjourn by 9.30. As you can see, we're down two members, so that should cut out some of our talking time, and maybe we'll get out of here before 9.30, and whatever hard jobs arise will be assigned to those members not present. That's how it works. That's how it works. Okay, so... Um, <laughs> Without further ado, let's start with recognitions. Dr. McLeod, do you have somebody? You'd like I'm to? actually, I do have a recognition, and, and so does Dr. Kavanaugh. Um, I really had meant to do this at our last meeting, and then I completely forgot because I was sleep deprived because of all the snow. <laughs> and now I realize that for the recognition that I wanted to do and, and, and want to do tonight is um, our DPW. Um, I think with all of the current weather conditions, I, I would suggest that people have no idea um, what is involved in, in the work. And they do it, They, you know, I was going to say they do it quietly, well, because we're all sleeping, but um, I really do depend on Mike Manzer to help me as one of the many considerations that I take when I'm making a decision about a snow day. Um, and when I call at 4.30 in the morning, he's been out for hours with his crew. I've heard multiple people talk about the conditions specifically of Hopkinton roads and about driving to work through multiple unnamed towns um, and how, how wonderful our town is specifically. And I really was remiss in not calling it out earlier, but um, we to recognize the tremendous work of our DPW and all of the, the workers, all of the plow drivers, the shovelers, the salt spreaders, the people who are out there making our roads safe, our sidewalks safe, our school buildings safe. Um, in addition, um, Tim Person, who um, is our own maintenance director of buildings and grounds and the work he's worked, um, he, be, he has become begun to work very closely with Mike um, and Don Freiberg this week was on, on the call list. Um, just so many people working quietly behind the scenes to keep us all safe and, and I really wanted to make sure that we recognize them. So thank you all. Thank you. And I'll turn it over if that's okay to Dr. Kavanaugh. Absolutely. Thank you. 
So I do have a recognition tonight, and I won't be talking much about this um, because I would like for our student and his teacher, uh, Craig Hay, who is the director of music education K-12, to do most of the talking about this. But last fall, Craig had come to me and said that he had a student who was into interested in developing a program where he could um, get musical instruments in the hands of students who may need them. And we've been working through some of the particulars around that, and I'm going to ask Andrew Cayley and Mr. Hay to come up and talk a little bit about the program. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, so um, um, I noticed that with our town and um, all of the, um, or we, we don't get a lot of um, support from, from um, the government with um, money for different musical instruments So um, because of our town being very well off. So I figured that to support um, people who cannot afford to buy musical instruments, we really need some support for that. Okay, so the mission statement was um, to uh, collect all um, unused and neglected instruments from the community and put them to use where, th where they're needed in the hands of people who need them. Next slide. Oh, yeah, this is the overview um, of this slideshow, basically. Um, so, all instruments that are in like good condition will be accepted, um, and also donations such, such as stands and mallets will also be accepted. Um, all instruments can be play tested by the music staff and Mr. Hay, um, and if um, and repairs can also be made by the staff. And instruments that are not accepted can be donated to other organizations um, along with being thrown away if they um, <laughs> recycled. <laughs> <Let's> see. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, exactly. That's so, um, all donations and drop offs can be, or, um, the, um, donators can um, can notify me by email or um, Mr. Hay if they are interested in donating, and they can either drop it off at the school or schedule a pickup time. Mm -hmm. And um, I've talked to other students that can um, help me with pickups. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Um, and here are some overflow mus um, instruments that yeah possible organizations that they could go to. Um, and also, yeah, tax deduction um, could be um, a big um, reason people would want to donate. So um, we, we need to work on, or I need to work on um, making a statement um, of the tax deduction for, for those people. Um, and all um, donated instruments um, will be... Um, become like community instruments of the school. Um, and there are a lot of instruments like that now um, that students can basically use um, and take home with them and practice with. And this is the property statement we have um, that uh, is what the donators will read um, of like where the instruments go. Um, and I will make a lot of, or my reaching out to the community through, um, I'm going to try to get an article in the Hawkington Independent. I can make flyers and um, make announcements in school and, and also through the school newsletter, I think would be a good, a good way. Right. So I just have a question for you because I think that the work you're doing is really important and I'm not sure that everyone understands the actual cost of a musical instrument. 
So one of the, the questions that I would have for you is if I went to David French and I wanted to buy a brand new clarinet, what would sort of be the cost range for an instrument like that? Brand new clarinets roughly are about $1,000 for a student instrument. Um, when Andrew came to me with this idea for uh, the project and, and in one sense building our inventory a little bit, um, I know that the school committee and, and administration knows that over the last few years we've been trying to replace some instruments that um, in some cases date back to uh, when the high school was on Main Street. And <laughs> while those instruments have had um, some wonderful use over the past 70 plus years, um, it's, not the, it's not what we want to put in students' hands. And we've been slowly, uh, instrument at a time, purchasing some new things, and, and thank you for your continued support on that. But uh, one of the big things that I feel that we can do uh, and that Andrew can do with this project is bring in uh, instruments that have been slightly used, gently used, maybe not so gently used, depending on the child, um, but things that we can have in the school that are in working condition and that we can give back to the community as basically loners for their time in their elementary middle school years. Um, we understand that budgets are tight and we're very lucky in this community that many parents, many families uh, spend money to rent the instrument, buy reeds, buy oil, buy music um, to help their kids continue on in, in, in music education. Uh, John's family, or John, I just called you your brother, sorry, Andrew's <laughs> family um, and his older brother John, uh, both have been in the music program. Uh, both Andrew and his brother have excelled in the music program, uh, have made district. He just Andrew just participated in the district festival uh, this nice. past weekend, uh, have earned all state honors. Andrew was in all state last year and will be trying out again this Saturday. Um, you know, and we want to make sure that uh, future generations have the same um, uh, uh, opportunities. Yeah, opportunities are just, you know, I, I'm looking for a different word, but just, yeah, opportunities to continue excelling in the music program. Andrew, what do you play? I play trombone. Nice. Well, thank you for the work that you're doing. Mm. It's such important work, and I think that many students to come will benefit from this. Mm. So. And thank you for being here tonight and putting this together. Thank you. I think uh, this is really a remarkable thing that you're doing, and, and with all due respect to a tax um, receipt, I think that what will inspire people to participate in this program is just, you know, the fact that a student has brought this forward. It's such a thoughtful thing to do. It's such a practical thing to do. Um, and I happen to know someone sitting to my left that works with the Hopkinton Independent, so you might want to reach out to her and see if she could help you facilitate the placement of an article in that particular um, newspaper. Uh, and I, I'm quite sure that you know those of us who are on social media would be happy to share this appeal. And I, I just think this is a fantastic idea, and I'm so grateful to you for thinking of it. Uh, it this is a really remarkable thing that you're doing, so thank you very much. Thanks. Excellent. It's great out of the box thinking that is allowing kids who maybe would shy away from music, to, I would think, to participate. And kudos to both you and the music department for supporting this. It's greatly appreciated. Is this up and running already? No. <laughs> not yet? Not yet, no. Work in progress? Mm -hmm. um, do you anticipate like the end of this year? You have a, a rough Anticipate timeline? to start getting the word out. Um, throughout the spring and, and get that up and running. That'll give us the summer if we have donations to start looking through instruments. I mean, we've been, people have been very generous in town as they've moved out, they've dropped off instruments and um, we've been able to include those in inventory. Some people, you know, they would like a letter for their tax purposes. Other people are like, just get it off my hands. Um, but I think this will um, not only help build the inventory that we have here in Hopkinton, but like we said, just getting more instruments into students' hands. You know, if we have, uh, you know, almost a library of instruments that we can loan to beginners in Hopkins, um, that might get two or three kids who may not have wanted to participate, or parents who are having, you know, paycheck to paycheck issues, to want to participate. And 
you're, you're definitely going to get. I think this is, as you were talking, I think of some of the social media sites where they're, you know, it's basically a free yard sale. Mm. You know, come pick this up from my house. Buy nothing. And the yeah. thing, buy nothing. The things people mm. give away, it's absolutely unbelievable. And so instruments, something that's so useful and is just sitting and collecting dust in their closets, I think you're going to have an enormous amount of success with this. This is a really good idea. I actually have a clarinet sitting in my house. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have an oboe ready to one. go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Great. I mean, you, this is a great idea. Good job. It's an awesome idea. I think as a practical matter, we probably have to accept them as gifts in our uh, items, in our packets, but I'll let you work those details out with Ms. Rodemick, and we will gladly do so. So um, thank you very, very much. This is exceptional, what you've done. Thank you. Great. Thank great. you. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Um, Oh, and does anybody else have any other recognitions? I wanted to. Oh, nope. I, I, I wanted to do one more recognition, which was on Monday for Martin Luther King Day. I had the opportunity, which I know a lot of people did, to attend the Youth Commission's um, program. It was phenomenal. It really, it was great in the number of people that were in and out throughout the day. Mm -hmm. Tamoria Sabo, who's the chair of the Youth Commission, and all of the Youth Commission worked so hard to put on a, an event of that size. I, I know just from other events that we've all been to how much goes into it, but the speakers and the service projects and things that were done were really uh, top notch. And I know I was only there, able to be there for the morning portion of the program, but people that I heard from that were there in the afternoon said it was just as good. It was really. Oh, that's right. And I think it's so hard to to take something that's already such a great program and right. make it better, but they really added up quite a bit, I thought, of new programming and depth this year, so kudos to the Youth Commission, and thank you for, for doing that. It seemed like a, a big hit. The storyteller, Valerie Tutson, was phenomenal. She was able to bring song in and just seamlessly transition and, and told really good, relevant story and just really was relatable to both the kids and the adults. It was fun to to watch the kids sitting on the floor listening. Oh, that's awesome. And our high school um, boys um, freshman team played the Special Olympics team yes. um, basketball, right. which I was able to watch with my kids. And it, what, I mean, yeah. such a great group of, of kids and adults on the, on the court. It was awesome. It was really, really great. And it was pretty packed stands, too. So they had a good turnout. It was good. Did you have the opportunity to win the girls middle school bathroom that was done yes. by the scout. I, yeah, yeah. I saw the pictures of it in the news, but it was yeah. it, the service projects that were done were very nice. Oh, it was in the bathroom stall, I saw it. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, people were, <laughs> did you see the bathroom? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was the talk in the hallway. Like, yeah. No detail left undone. That's, yeah. that's great. All right, anything else from anybody? All right, so why don't we move into our student council report. So we'll invite Alex and... I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself. I don't know you. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so just to introduce ourselves again, uh, hi, my name is Alex Bojack, and I'm a junior at the high school. And I'm Celia Potis, and I, too, am a junior at the high school. Uh, so we'll get started on a few things. Uh, first off, this week is exam week, so we're about halfway done for the exams. Um, it's going pretty well so far for everyone, and our last exam is on Monday, uh, which means we'll start the second semester on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And I think that starts with a B day, so on the schedule, and that means all students will be getting out in the high school at around 11.15 to 11.30, and uh, next uh, we're having a class meeting for course selections coming up to talk about the different uh, varieties students can get into or get involved. Uh, and in high school, we have a lot to provide for different courses, mm -hmm. especially as you get older. You have a very broad, big, or very broad, like, choices, I guess. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we'll get, uh, that meeting will be at the end of February, which seems uh, a little close for us, because mm -hmm. uh, Second semester hasn't started yet. We're already thinking about our courses for next year. Um, also, uh, just a few student council members went to uh, Senator Spilka's conference about mindfulness. Um, it took place in the Warren Center. Uh, and they had various professionals and students from different communities talk about uh, social and emotional learning and just managing stress levels when uh, building your curriculum. 
so from what I heard from those students, it ended up being a great opportunity where they got to uh, meet some of those professionals and uh, meet other students. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. And then also, uh, winter sports are going fantastic at the high school. We have swim and dive, uh, indoor track, um, wrestling, uh, girls and boys basketball, hockey, and did I cover it all? Alpine. Sorry? Alpine skiing. Skiing, oh, yes. That's right, the skiing Ski team. Yeah. yeah. So from everything I've heard, they're all going great. I've been to a couple games and meets, and everyone's been doing fantastic. Mm -hmm. so. Uh, we've seen a couple of new clubs along uh, with the sports as an extracurricular. Uh, one of the new ones has been a club called Hello Hillers. Uh, and with all the new students that have been transferring recently to the school, a group of students have put together a club to give out tours to some of these new students uh, to help them integrate back into the, the school community and uh, get situated in Huffington. A great idea. Uh, yeah. Like the welcome yeah. wagon. That's yeah. really nice. <laughs> yeah. um, so, yeah, it's been a great presence. Uh, also, with some other extracurriculars, uh, Be Free has one of their coffee houses coming up uh, February 9th. So uh, I believe the location is still being determined, but uh, hope we're hoping for a good turnout at that event. Yeah, and then I think the most recent thing to happen in the high school was we recently had a new club as well called Pay It Forward put up sticky notes all around the school. I don't know if you've seen it, but they're all little positive notes, and they're found in pretty much every locker and every door. And um, it's a new club, and it's just a good way to give back to the community and help out with school, especially during a stressful time, like midterms. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, and one other meeting, uh, the school council is meeting January 31st, where they're going to be discussing overrides, uh, just the process and how uh, that will work in the future. Uh, and they'll hopefully be discussing uh, schedules, uh, possibly, with uh, the midterm time and the finals as well in the future. Uh, um, anything else? Um, I guess one more thing. Student Council um, is putting together a proposal to talk about uh, food in the classroom. Um, so at the current moment, it's not, there's a little bit of a gray area as to what's allowed, what's not, um, and Student Council is putting together something to better define that for both the teachers and the students so that Hopefully, students will have a better idea of what they're allowed to bring in the classroom and what they're not allowed to bring in the classroom. And um, teachers will be able to communicate uh, what their uh, idea of keeping food in the classroom would be, whether they're just trying to make sure everything's been cleaned up or they're trying to protect from allergies. Uh, right now, it's a little confusing sometimes, and it changes from class to class. Uh, but this will hopefully bring up the conversation again and uh, make people uh, a little bit more clear about what the food is like in the classrooms. Anything else? Um, and yeah. farther in the future, there's cotillion for the freshmen and sophomores, and then there's eventually prom in May. It's exciting, and I think that's it for now. Yeah. Do you guys have any questions for us? Yeah. At all? You guys have been busy. <laughs> How are um, exams going? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not bad. Yeah. yeah. Fine. Oh, okay. <laughs> you all ready for tomorrow? Yeah. Mostly, yeah. Actually, so I, then you'd like to stay and listen to the rest of our meeting? Uh, <laughs> yeah, <a few> seats. <laughs> yeah. No, that's excellent. Thank you. Did you guys have any questions? No. Thank you, as always, um, for being here. That's really informative. We love to hear about what's going on in the high school, so thank you very much. Great. Yeah, thank, thank you. you for having us. Good luck with the rest of your exams. Thank you. And with next semester. <laughs> And I'm realizing that in my haste to get to the student council report, I neglected to open up the public comment period. So if there's anybody in the audience who is here for public comment, I'm sorry. It's okay, we got one. Sure, yes, please, right here. I apologize. No problem. So I don't know if you've been with us before for public comment. We'll just ask you to introduce yourself. And well, my name is Brent McKenzie, and I have lived in Hopkinton for about 20 years. Um, I have a daughter who graduated from the high school two years ago, and my son Ben is a 10th grader, is, is an 11th grader. Um, and I'm here tonight um, on behalf uh, of supporting the high school baseball um, field enhancement project. Um, just a couple of things on that. Uh, Principal Bishop, Athletic Director King, and Steve Simos, the um, high school teacher and baseball coach, have done, um, in my opinion, a tremendous job of 
leading the academic and athletic portions of, of the high school and the athletic program and, and the baseball program in particular. And I feel like their leadership is bringing a very steady hand um, and a lot of solidarity, a lot of strength, a lot of character building among the kids um, to the community. And I, I'm very appreciative of that and I'm very happy to be here in support of the project that Steve and uh, Ms. King are gonna talk to you guys about later. Great, so thank, thank you. you very much. And I swear that was not a setup for my next uh, <laughs> request, which is to take that particular item out of order, since we have so many people here who um, are here for that particular agenda item. So if nobody has any objection. Anybody else? Oh, I don't, yeah, I'm sorry. Are there any other people for public comment? Thank you. Okay. Now I would like to ask your indulgence to take the baseball field memorial project out of order. So um, who's all coming up? Come on up. Thank you so much for having us tonight. You guys are probably getting sick of seeing me here. <laughs> <after No. me. laughs> um, but really appreciate you adding this in. Um, as I'm going to let Coach Simos do the majority of the um, talking as he has really spearheaded this project along with some other um, really passionate, involved community members, um, parents, student athletes. Um, I, I was the one who got it on the agenda tonight, so I want to be pretty clear about Way the amount of work that I personally have put into this. So he um, has done so much, has run it all by me and, and vetted it in that way. Um, but I think it's a fantastic project, and I'm excited to, for you to hear about it tonight. Um, and certainly we'll have an opportunity after uh, Coach Simos talks a little bit about it for questions and, and anything you might be interested in asking, but I'm going to let him explain. You could call me Steve. Why? Yeah, you're uh, Coach Simos. <laughs> Coach and Mr. Simos tonight. So I have a saxophone and a trombone that my <laughs> sons have denigrated. Uh, so the, last year when I returned to the baseball program, um, these two ideas kind of came together simultaneously. It's um, <laughs> We do have some logistical problems at the field. Um, a lot have been addressed in terms of the playing surface, but we have some fan safety issues and some fan viewing issues. Um, we are, I believe, the only varsity program that doesn't have a, an acceptable uh, fan viewing area where they can see the game without looking through a fence or it be in harm's way. Um, so the thinking in, in traveling around to watch some summer baseball and seeing various ideas that started it. Simultaneously, um, Tommy McIntyre, Hopkinton High School graduate in 1972, a top of the Hiller, top of the Hill award winner, and just an unbelievable human being and contributor to the community passed away. Um, so the thoughts kind of merged together where if we could improve a field where Tommy would have, in all due respect, he would have already done it and then apologized to you later. Um, he, uh, where he would have definitely spearheaded the whole operation. Um, we thought it would have been an, an outstanding idea to do something in tribute to him. He has done work on every field on this campus, um, anonymously, humbly, and usually in the dark of night um, without asking any recognition. And um, so in bringing that to community members, the response has been overwhelming on how many people want to support that and kind of simultaneously help the student athletes and honor Tommy. And his family is very much like Tommy, very understated, very humble, and they do want to make sure they're honored by it, but they do want to make sure that um, it is done in a very low-key manner. So we were talking about naming something, we're, I guess we're typically, we're, we're uh, specifically not naming something, we're honoring Tommy with a plaque that we hope to be a, a very well done um, viewing plaza behind home plate of the current baseball field. Um, and simultaneously it'll take the fans off of the, <laughs> off of the uh, target areas of the field and <laughs> give them a pretty good uh, place to watch their, their sons play. 
So I can answer any question. I don't know, you know what direction to take this. Uh, I can answer any questions you have about the project or go through what we hope to do. I'll, I'll leave that up to you. Do you guys have questions about? Not, I mean, no, do you, what, what do you think the best? We do have the, um, we do have the materials already in our packet that we all read. Yeah. Could, I could, yeah. if I may, yeah. you just add a little, a little bit of uh, context to, to the I, request. I'm sorry. I did make some picture uh, copies. Excellent. Of, awesome. Yeah. That's mine. my kind of drawing. I can see it without removing my glasses. Thank you. Anybody? Of course. Thank you. Well, you must have double majored in like Thank architecture or something. The yes. drawings that you yes. come to me with, I've been actually very impressed. First one is the architectural firm of Simos and Simos. <laughs> um, so just to show you really quickly, the, the, dark, um, the dark lines are the current backstop, which is a three-pronged um, area facing the, the mound. That is going to come down if the project is approved. And the double line you see going across from opening to opening, that is the proposed brick wall and netting backstop where we would then bring stands in in that 20 by 10 area. And that um, semicircle, you'll see, is the, is the plaza that we hope to kind of dedicate to Tommy. These are just pictures off the web of, of similar to what we would be doing. Uh, the first one is the, a brick wall. Ours will be a 40 foot long by three foot high brick wall, uh, padded on one side. And then, um, and that'll be directly behind the, the net. Ours will not be three sides. It'll just be a one uh, 40 foot run. The next picture is just a sample of how the poles will be mounted on the piers at the end. Ours will be much more professionally done. Thanks to our engineer in the back. Uh, the next picture is a, I, I just Googled stone wall. So, um, <laughs> I hope it looks as nice as that one, but we're going to have a uh, local landscaper who's going to be doing a stone wall around the perimeter of it. And so a brick wall behind home plate, a stone wall around the perimeter, which will be on an, an arc. And then the, uh, the area in between will be brick pavers, and that will be the quote-unquote plaza. I took a picture of the next one of um, the plaque at Dave Hughes Stadium. And that's kind of what I foresee along the same lines, kind of understated right on the wall facing uh, the stands. And maybe um, a plaque or two on either side or on either end, um, acknowledging donors and the contractors who participated um, in that kind of fashion. Uh, and the next one is just a donor plaque, that, a sample donor plaque. So just a couple of quick things to add. Um, first, I'd, I'd like the opportunity to publicly thank Steve for um, the work that he's done. It's, a, it's been a tremendous amount. Um, and really, it's been at this point just gauging general interest and seeing if, if this ever were to be something that were to be approved, would people be in support of it? And the outpouring of people who have said, yes, we'd love to support a project of this nature has actually been nothing short of amazing. It's, it's really been amazing and people just coming up to me randomly at games or different things and being like, hey, I heard that this something that could potentially happen. I'd love to help <coughs> or I'd love to donate. <coughs> Excuse me. So I um, so really, really appreciate his work and it, I think, is a testament to Tommy McIntyre, just how many people are just willing to, to donate their either services, materials, or financially um, donate. I'd also like to take a moment just to acknowledge um, those who are here tonight in support of the project. Um, many of our student athletes who are 
in season right now, have midterms this week, um, but also members of the baseball team um, and their, their parents who are here to just show support for something that they, they feel is important and support of their coach who has spearheaded this project. I think it just shows how many people are invested and in, in interested in creating what we think would be just a really great enhancement in honor of someone who has just given so much of their time and energy into our community. So mm -hmm. um, the last the last piece of it that I'll say that has actually come up as a question a few times is that um, in some rumblings of talking about this potential project, some people have said, wait a second, isn't, if the if the turf field is passed, isn't that going to be the varsity baseball fields? And I thought it was important to acknowledge that um, both field two and the turf would be the varsity baseball field because it's a, the turf, if passed, would be a shared field. So, for example, if there's a lacrosse game happening at that time, baseball might be happening on field two. So um, we, we would hope to be enhancing a field that will be used certainly by the varsity team, but also by all our sub-varsity teams, um, solving some safety concerns that we feel or we hope would be addressed, but also in honor of someone really important. So... Um, just wanted to make sure that, that those points came across um, and certainly answer any other questions that you might have. It's also, um, it's also a, a high traffic community access point there too as on the way to the other fields. And one of the things I, I was speaking with Dee about that I'm really happy about is eight other varsity boys and girls programs have already emailed me wanting to donate to the project. Oh, that's really nice. Um, from their own team's fundraising, which is really, really cool. Because um, I, you know, in telling them that Tommy did spread his, uh, he had a son and a daughter who played, but you could never have known which teams his son and daughter were on. He helped everyone uh, equally, so. Did you guys have a question? So I did, I did have a question, because in looking at this, is phenomenal how much has gone into this. The, so Coming here, there are some of the pieces, the financial pieces that are to be t determined. So, are you? Where is that funding coming from? Would be is that okay. you're looking? Are you looking to us for funding for that, or do you have other funding sources? We would accept anything you would offer. Uh, Trumbull. <laughs> Trumbull. Um, um. Yeah. So. These guys have really led that in terms of um, communicating. It, mostly now it's just been um, word of mouth and telling people about it. I started it through um, Tommy's former company and the contractors he worked with, and they um, blew me away with what they were offering in terms of discount and labor and all that. In terms of the fundraising, um, we wanted to keep it very simple in terms of a donor plaque acknowledging individual or corporate donors that would be on the wall. Um, and I've written a letter to that effect. And also um, perhaps one larger sign, that a, a single sign on our scoreboard that we would, that we would hope to sell. But that's, those are the, the thoughts at this point. Um, so primarily fundraising. Is where right. you, yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. No, it's yeah. Yeah. Do you have an estimate for the cost of the project? It's yeah. Uh, I'm going to look for help here, my experts. So we were estimating fifty to sixty thousand okay. um, dollars, and that has come down considerably, I think, through the through the offers of labor or materials. Um, so I think. My my gut I don't want, I don't want to count my chickens my gut is that the fundraising will will happen pretty seamlessly. So. Therefore, offsetting any additional cost. <laughs> <laughs> I think mine's, mine's a little tight. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, it is. No. <laughs> yeah. No. The the when when Steve and I first talked about this project, I love the idea, but also right. am pr very cognizant of budgets and, and where everything's at. And I said we're just right at this moment not at a point where I would feel comfortable asking for you I think there are other things that not more important but might be necessity um so you know and he and I talked about that and that's where I think um there's a a lot of people very willing to to donate to this if it were a project to be approved um 
And if he or I had concern about that, we probably wouldn't have at this time come to come to right. present it as a potential project. But thank you for asking that so that we can make that clear. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the other question, and this, this maybe not the most intelligent question, but it, 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 this is baseball only, right? It's not softball can't play on baseball fields. No. That, okay. Nope. That's no. Nope. They have their own. And they have, and, and, and softball has a little bit of a different situation in a good way is that they do have a, an ac a viewing access area that's just not, you know, it's, it's safe from the standpoint of where the fencing is. Their dugouts are more separate. Yep. Um, so that is something that certainly we thought about in terms of equity and, and you know, Title IX and making sure. And it's a very, it's an important question, but um, it is something that softball actually already, which is good and bad, it has a little bit of a better situation in terms of their viewing where there aren't any issues there. Interestingly, our current backstop, which needs to come down, and the softball viewing area, batting cage, were constructed by Tommy. Mm. Oh, well. so, <laughs> so you'll just model it they're after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they were lamenting the fact that it's in there pretty, pretty tightly. <laughs> <laughs> so you kind of just touched on the one question I had. So what, I mean, what's like the sort of the next step, I guess? What, I mean, it's a, I feel like it's a good idea. I don't know that anybody would argue against the fact that you guys have already invested a lot of time and thought and energy and into the process. So what, um, what needs to happen next from so, us and, and from? Yeah, we're ready to go. I mean, we, uh, it was a balance of laying the groundwork so we felt comfortable coming to you and coming, you know, coming to you prematurely. So um, the next step is to actually get the, um, the, the sequence of contractors is good for us because the two people perhaps most on board are ready to get going. And that's the removal of the current fencing and uh, dugout slabs and things like that. So completely weather dependent, they, um, th they wanted to come in and during vacation. So we kind of told them to calm down a little. So well, you need it in the spring season. Yeah, and right. one, other, yeah. one other piece of that puzzle that um, Steve and I did talk about is let's, t let's you know, think what, what if? What if it wasn't ready? Just by some chance, I mean, we know things get delayed. Um, fortunately, due to the collegiality of our league, we could swap home in a ways if we needed to, you know, versus we play everyone twice for the most part. So um, we've done that with other schools who have a project that maybe isn't complete. Medfield, when they were redoing their turf field, had to switch some home in a ways with us. And um, no one no one has issues with that. We Ideally, it's, it's done, and it is it gets completed, but if not, we do have some um, contingency planned in place just in case. May I just bring a little bit of context to the school committee uh, as regards this discussion because it's a little bit, and Janet might especially help you just because you're new. Um, I, I mean, you. not that you're new anymore, but it's your no, first year. Um, I'll take it for in that the, the timing is critical. The um, request as it comes to school committee giving that there's no funding requirement is also a little bit unusual, but the piece um, for you, you to consider tonight that's really critical is the naming policy, mm -hmm. is as it relates to the naming policy. Because most often uh, a project would be completed or maybe there's something already in place and then a group might come to you and say that they would like to name it, commemorate after somebody. Um, in this case, it's everything together. It's this project is being proposed in memory of Tommy and that the, that's where naming policy um, and why it was included in the pa packet is really relevant as you approve the project in its entirety, including um, the fact that it would be named after Tommy McIntyre. And that, that was kind of my question about what we do next because I wasn't sure if we were yeah. looking at the project as a whole. Yeah. Like you said, it, it, it is. was an awesome idea, but. We don't have really a whole lot of money to throw around at right now, so like, yeah. right, and if you've got fundraising and, and thoughts ahead, I mean, yeah. do we yeah. have to wait yeah. until that, that whole piece is done, yeah. or can, I don't know how you... Yeah, we're not asking so. for any money, I, yeah. and I am very confident that we can, I'm very confident we can raise the money, um, except, as Dr. McLeod said, it is, they're part and parcel because... Yeah, right. It's, so it's, in yeah. I think I can help walk us through the, the memory of Tommy is what's generating exactly. that interest. <laughs> I think I can help walk us through the procedural parts, and I know uh, 
since you're the government teacher, Mr. Simos, you know that we have a lot of rules and policies and procedures that we have to follow, which don't necessarily ever speed the process along. So we'll um, we'll Do make our way through. <laughs> no, so we'll make our way through um, through that in a second. But first, I have probably a very embarrassing and not smart question. But is there a problem having a brick wall behind the? home plate like kids don't run into that right is it fun? we tell them not to <laughs> okay <laughs> uh, it's actually more common than you would think to have a okay. brick wall All right. yeah so um we have the option i mean of, i figured you know what you're doing but that just seems yeah we have the option of padding that side of it okay um and it would depend the option yeah <laughs> just <laughs> some seasons want to keep yeah. them safe no <laughs> i know look yeah. at them yeah, so. they're, they're tough. tough. Like they're to keep tough. them intact the way they are now. <laughs> but if you look, if you look at other fields, it, it is done that way. Enough. Okay, so it's, right, it's, thank you. it's that picture you, you see there is a is a is a uh, existing backstop, right. the brick wall. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so unless people have questions about the project itself, let's talk to let's switch to the procedure. Okay. So I That's think right. you know again because of all of our rules, um, I think procedurally we have to probably do a couple of things first just like with our musical instruments we will have to accept all of these things as gifts correct i'm looking at susan who's the boss of all of our money um and i don't know i will leave it to you and mr simos to work out about the labor and how all of that works but as long as you're working with susan then i know we're in very good hands at dr mcleod too they know all of the rules that govern that so really the part that i think um, you know, we'll be prepared to accept those gifts as they come to us, and typically you don't have to come back every time they go in our items by consensus and we say thank you. So that's the easy part. Um, and then really all that remains, <coughs> excuse me, is the naming piece. Um, so we do have a policy for those who are of you who are fascinated. We have policy FF, which is naming of facilities or events, and I'm going to just walk us through it really quickly. And first, um, the requirement is that the... Um, facility space or event is named after a person um, with educational significance or inspiration so the person should have made a significant contribution to the educational community of Hopkinton as evidenced by contributions such as dedicated service to children and or persistent efforts to generate and sustain an effective educational system for all students and I can think of nobody that exemplifies that better than Tommy McIntyre who is also one of our inaugural top of the hill um, candidate uh, honorees Second, they must be deemed by the committee to be worthy of the honor of displaying at attributes that may include but are not limited to the following, leadership with a desire to make a difference, citizenship that models duties and obligations, service locally, nationally, or globally, exceptional character and reputation, excellent standards of ethics. And again, five for five. I mean, he was an outstanding individual, so I think that we can all agree that he is absolutely worthy of this honor. Um, so then we have just procedures that we need to go through. And this is the part, I don't know, Dr. McLeod, do these all apply to this? Um, what this says is that 60 days prior to naming a facility, space, or event, a public announcement of the intent to name will be made by the school committee at its regular meeting. And I think we can consider this mm -hmm. to be that. Mm -hmm. Um, the superintendent of schools will direct that news releases be distributed to local news media announcing the intent to name a facility, space, or event and inviting members of the community to suggest names either by writing to the superintendent of schools or by appearing before the school committee at its next regular meeting. I would suggest that that announcement announce our intent to name this area after Tommy McIntyre and invite people to comment at our next meeting. I would not, not recommend solicit. that we open up no. the opportunity to name it after anyone else. Um, at the first regular meeting of the committee, following the initial announcement, member of the community, members of the community may appear before the committee to have the opportunity pre to present their suggestions. The superintendent will su suggest, I'm sorry, you know what, here's a whole another section calling naming requests, called naming requests. The following procedure shall be followed when there is a formal request to have a facility, space, or event dedicated to an individual. This is the situation we're in. Excuse me for the 
that part earlier. Um, the following procedures shall be followed. A written explanation outlining the specific reasons why a facility, space, or event should be dedicated to a particular individual. You have submitted that, and we have it in our packet, so mm -hmm. thank you. The school committee will meet with the petitioners, as we are now, to listen to their explanation, considering the dedication request, and take the request under advisement for a period of at least 60 days. The school committee will then take action on the request at a regularly scheduled meeting, applying the selection criteria previously listed in this policy. So given that, my suggestion is that we put this on, a, on an agenda 60 days from now to formally um, agree to, to name this, this area after Tawny McIntyre, and that should take care of it. Yeah, that will take care of the formality. In the meantime, there would be no reason why the work no, could not be No, and you begin. absolutely should go ahead. And do that. So we we have. You to, can do it. You don't to have to do it under the dark of night anymore. That's right. <laughs> it is more fun though. Um, so yeah, I think you should consider this your formal blessing to to move forward. We'll be excited in 60 days to hear about the progress that you've made, and we will officially, you know, bless the naming at that point. Does that sound fair? Thank you very much. Do we do we need to do you want to vote to that on that? Should we vote on that? Okay, that's fine. We don't usually vote. That's, no. Well, no, you're right. No harm. I'm sorry, you're right. Okay, so I would be looking for a motion to um, to name the uh, to accept the naming request and then put in the piece about the 60 days that you just said. To accept the naming request. Mm -hmm. I, um, what I was struggling with was of the. Plaza. plaza, thank you. The baseball varsity plaza? Blaze baseball plaza. Okay. Um, After Tom McIntyre. To be taken under advisement for a period of 60 days. Mm -hmm. And then we'll come back in 60 days and vote it again. In 60 days, we will be just about into baseball. <laughs> well, in you'll be spring. inviting us to the be perfect. to the, be ready. the we'll naming be ready ceremony. The, yeah. Okay. So I think I just <laughs> did. I just yes. hear someone make that motion. Yes. Uh, I think okay. Jen. And a second. I second. Okay. So a motion by Miss Devlin, a second by Miss Cavanaugh. All in favor? Yes. 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 Okay. And that's unanimous. Um, so thank you, thank you very much for doing this. Um, we really appreciate it. Boys, this is a wonderful thing that you're doing in honor awesome. of a very important man. So thank you very much. Um, we really appreciate it and solved a problem that we had as well, which is a fitting tribute to Tommy McIntyre. So thank you all for being here. You're thank more than you welcome so to stay if you like. But Good luck to all of you with your exams and with your baseball season. Go Hillers. And cards. Looking for an invitation. Season. <laughs> Whatever season you're in now. <laughs> yeah, right. Thank you so much. Okay, thank, thank you guys. You. Thanks, Steve. Should we perhaps yes. He does. Okay. So why don't we um, continue if it's okay with you we'll continue to take a couple of things out of order sure since mr bishop's already here mr bishop um we will invite you up early if you unless you okay um, <laughs> thank you for joining us so good night thank you was it something i said or? <laughs> um okay so dr mcleod we're, we have the High school student handbooks. Right, thank you. So um, we will be coming back a little bit later in a couple of months with the with the handbook um, yes. as a whole for your approval. Right. Uh, but we didn't want to wait for that. So Mr. Bishop is here tonight to talk about one change to the handbook um, as it relates to the use of tobacco products. And um, I know that you had shared earlier today um, a YouTube that um, was really informative. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, but I think I would turn it over to Mr. Bishop. Great. Great, thank you. And thank you for having me this evening. I appreciate you making time for me on the agenda. Um, I actually have two topics I'm going to talk about. One is one that I really enjoy coming to, which is the international programs and talking about kind of where we're planning on going on trips in 2019. Uh, and this topic is not something that I'm as excited about bringing <laughs> to your attention. But um, 
and it's around vaping or juuling is what uh, the kids will often call it. Uh, it has continued to be a problem at the high school this year. Um, I believe you have a copy of the letter that I sent out back in November to the parents and students. Uh, and that was really to kind of get out the concern that we have at the high school. We're seeing the usage increase. Um, and really to try to educate the parents of what, what vaping is, what does it look like, and what are the effects. Um, you may be aware that many, many other high schools in the area, in the East, um, around the country really, uh, were sending out letters to their communities around the same time that we did. Um, I'm fortunate to be part of a um, group of principals that gets together once a month. I'm actually going to Milton High tomorrow. Uh, it's usually on Friday mornings. And one of the consistent agenda topics from the beginning of this year on every one of our radars is, is vaping. And what are we doing as schools to, to, to kind of stop it? So we were hoping when we sent that letter out in November that we would see a decrease in usage. Uh, unfortunately, that just has not happened. Um, and we continue to see students um, uh, kind of be re repeat offenders. And, and that is not typical. We typically, um, with any other type of handbook violation, whether it's cutting class, alcohol, drugs, tobacco, Typically, when a student gets in, in, in trouble, they don't necessarily repeat that behavior. And we're, and we're seeing this with vaping continue to, to, to happen. So, um, you know, we are not an admin uh, staff, I, I don't believe, that likes to send messages or that likes to um, impose more consequences to deter the behavior of students. We think it's more about um, having them learn from their mistakes and, and the education piece. Um, but all of our typical moves around this topic are, are not seeming to work for us. And so that's why we're here. Um, you know, we, we, uh, I was just actually talking with Ms. King uh, before they came up for that wonderful presentation about how vaping has become the number one chemical health violation in the Tri-Valley League in terms mm. of the athletes. And, so, and that's not surprising to, I don't think, anybody uh, in terms of the principles around this area. So we wanted to come here and, and talk about a, a change we wanted to make to our handbook uh, and, and have that effective immediately. And when we have our class meetings that our students talked about, we would be able to inform the students of, of hopefully this, this change. But we also want to do some education. And so the, the, ch the change in the handbook, uh, as I believe you have some of that language. Um, right now, we have a consequence. Uh, if, if a student gets caught uh, vaping at school, there's, there's a one-day in-school suspension on the first offense and, the, and also loss of privileges if you're an upperclassman. Second offense is a one day out of school. Uh, and typically students when they apply to college will have to report if they've ever been suspended outside of school. But it's not necessarily the case when it's an inside school suspension. I think it's kind of important to make that, uh, that difference. And then any subsequent violations could be up to five days. And so we have, um, are now proposing on the first offense that it be a two day out of school suspension. Uh, so that is a, a significant increase. Uh, and then for subsequent violations, it would be up to that five days. Um, what we're also wanting to do, and we've started work on this, is to uh, come up with an education program as well. We don't just want to say, you're suspended from school, we don't want you here. We want the students here. We want them to learn from their mistakes, like I said before. So we are working with uh, our school nurse to try to develop an educational program around vaping. And if a student gets caught, maybe they have to go through a process of a class with the nurse and produce a product of something they've learned about the product um, and how, what, how it affects their body. So we're not quite there to have that language yet in the handbook, um, but we've started that process with a subcommittee at the high school of putting together some ideas because to me that's the most important piece. It's not the consequence necessarily, although I feel we have to go in that direction to see if we can curb the usage. It's more around education. So we're here again to, to, to talk about the change in the, in the handbook. But we'll also maybe be coming back um, in a few months when we talk about the overall handbook and talk about maybe the education program that we're hoping to develop uh, as well. I do have, if you are interested, um, we have some um, confiscated uh, paraphernalia. If you are, uh, if, I was if guessing it wasn't an iPhone. I yeah, it's not an iPhone six. No, it's not. It's just a case. And so. Um, one of the ones I think that is most popular that I th from, from our students, uh, unfortunately, is, is, is this. It's called the Jewel, uh, and this is the video that I sent you as well. I think it's just important to be able to see it, how small it is, and how it can be kept in, in someone's hand. It's really tough to see. Uh, and this is the, the Jewel mod. Um, and there is nicotine salts in this, which, um, which we have been told we, there was actually a vaping presentation at Westwood High School that Mr. Pominville and Mr. Hanna went to. Uh, and it was very informative, and they talked about how in one of these um, pods here is about a pack of cigarettes in terms of the type of nicotine that's in there. Uh, so these are the ones that we most commonly see. They're in different flavors. Again, it's very in, it's very small. Um, and there's a charger here. And the charging unit actually is something that it's a, U a USB. So you would think it would be a regular iPhone charger and it can plug into the side of a computer. So um, things that are all things that we're kind of getting up to speed with um, that's very interesting. So that's the one that probably is the most 
um, common. I can keep going if you like. There's a bigger one here. Uh, this is a different type of uh, device. This one is a little bit more powerful for students and also is a button to actually heat up the gel that's in there. Uh, so this is kind of an older model. This is kind of a, a newer model uh, from what we've been told. Um, again, I'm not an expert on any of, of this. I'm still learning myself. This is kind of what the, the, the e-juice or the, the liquid that the students will use to, to be able to, to put into some of the, the different devices that, that, that exist. But again, it kind of looks like a pen. Um, most of the incidents that we have um, been brought in on happen typically in the bathrooms. Um, but there have been some, some situations that have happened in hallways and classrooms which uh, are extremely unfortunate. So that's why we feel like at this point we need to, to really do something to, to help, um, help students understand that this is not acceptable here and that hopefully that will change their behavior. So, so I, I have a, two questions. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, just from an edge, my just f curious. Yeah. So first of all, what's the charger do? The charger charges the battery for the this device, so this needs and, to be charged. And why does it need to be charged to use it? Just that's just the way that they're it works. They're made. Yes. The way so it's made. when yeah. I saw the YouTube, I was surprised because I thought I saw smoke, but yeah. is there smoke? Smoke. Related? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But it's a, it's a, it's not like a typical if you took a, 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 a cigarette necessarily. It's not the same type of smoke. It's much mm -hmm. less noticeable. Um, but, but there is it, smoke that comes out. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, the fact the fact that it could still happen in the hallway, even though there's I guess I was imagining if there was smoke coming out of somebody's mouth, then it would be pretty hard to hide that. Yeah, it's not. So the the, the video that I sent, I think that was not the, that was one of these older devices where the, the smoke is much more pronounced. Oh. Out. These newer models, it's very difficult okay. to I see the smoke curious. being. Yeah, uh, not that it relates to anything. It was just my own curiosity. Yep. Yeah, and it's not yeah. like a typical smoke. It's, it's also yeah. it's often flavored. Okay. There's different mm -hmm. flavors. Like you can see here, there's just you know, this would be a lime flavored fuel mod. So there's just different flavors. It's an yep. orange. So. The smell is not what you would expect it to smell mm. like either for someone who is not necessarily uh -huh. knowledgeable about vaping. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? I have one, and I mean, I definitely, I'm 100% with you that, you know, this is like, we have to do something about this. Um, but as you said, it is a big change from one in-school suspension to two out-of-school suspension. So I was just curious what were your, you and your admin team's line of thinking Thoughts, yes. making that jump. Yeah. Yep, yep. So um, the reason we jumped to that, I feel, is if you could look in the current consequences, the first is an in-school suspension. And we've had many repeat offenders, and they get that one day out-of-school suspension. And, and in many cases, it's been a third offense. And so that one day out-of-school suspension still has not deterred many of the students. And when I say many, it's, a, it's not a large group, but it's a, it's a larger group than we would like to, to see. Uh, and so that's why we felt we had to kind of step that up just a little bit more, uh, because that's, that second offense current consequence has not necessarily deterred as much as we'd like to see. Yeah. Can I ask a, a question that mm -hmm. just for my own edification? The, so in out-of-school suspension, they have to acknowledge on college admissions, but they don't have to acknowledge an in in-house suspension? Yeah, so when you um, go through the process of applying to college and it's, and it's the school doesn't send that, the, the high school does right. not send that information to, to colleges, but in most applications now there is going to be, especially online applications, there'll be a section to say, have you ever been suspended outside of school? If so, please explain. And so it's the family's discretion if they want to disclose that. But it says outside of school. It doesn't say, have you just been so suspended is it? from school? Um, I have a question. In the proposed language that we have, mm -hmm. it says, in this last sentence, it says something about fines, but the fines aren't included. Is that something you're still working on? Or? We've talked about that, yeah. Um, we've, we had fines uh, probably about five or six years ago in our handbook when it came to tobacco products. Um, and it's sometimes difficult to enforce the fine aspect of it. And that's something that we thought about with this. Um, that was part of one of our initial proposals, but we felt if we stick to the, the school consequence and try to add that education piece, we hope that would be enough without okay. having to go down the road of, of the fines. But that was something that I, I spoke with Dr. McLeod about, also with Mr. Hanner and Mr. Palmerville. We just felt that it, we, we didn't want to go in that direction quite yet. Yeah. So is that last paragraph in? As it relates to the reading of the actual yeah, policy, if you look at it, you don't have it in front of you, Evan, but yeah. it's redlined in what the school committee has. Oh, okay. And that last piece that, right, that references MGL 270. I'm wondering if that just was meant to come out. It was meant to come out. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because okay. in my entire I have this piece without that on there. So that was, again, just we discussed that that was actually okay. on our initial proposal before bringing it to you, and we decided to. I just want to make sure we're voting on the right yep. thing. We, we, we okay. could go in that direction. It's something that is it's, uh, a possible consequence. Many schools do have that, but we didn't want to go in that so direction. So this gives you the opportunity to see the efficacy of these changes, and then we're going to go through the regular handbook review yeah. in a couple of weeks anyway, and yeah. you can always... And we'll be able to I'll be able to see what... Uh, you know. We have seen a little bit of a decrease since we've gotten back from the holidays. It's not a, a tremendous amount of time so far, but if we were to implement this, explain it to the students uh, next week at the class meetings, when we come back in a few months, I'd be able to see... A, Bring some statistics to see if it's, it, it's, it has any impact so far, which I'm hoping it will. Okay. And are these consequences in addition to you mentioned made mention of some of the the teams? I mean, do they have a, their own probably team policy? Yeah, there's an MIAA handbook yeah, as well. Yeah. yeah. So okay. if a student is caught um, uh, with alcohol, drugs, but a tobacco product, usually they get suspended. Their first offense is 25 percent of the, the season. Mm -hmm. okay. Second offense, I believe, is 60 percent. Have there been many of those MIAA suspensions because of this? Yes. I would think that would deter them. Only bit. That's the only. That's, the, that's all we've had so far this year. Okay. All right. All right. Any other questions? And your recommendation mm -hmm. is that we approve. My this recommendation one. is that this is approved. Yes. Okay. All right. So I'm just looking for a motion to approve the change to the high school student handbook as outlined in the agenda materials. So moved. And a second. I'll second. Okay, so a motion by Ms. Cavanaugh, a second by Ms. Devlin. All in favor? Yes. Yes. And that is unanimous. So thank you very much. And we can move on to the international travel requests. And that we can turn well, right over to Mr. Bishop. Yeah, thank is, you yeah. so much for being this here. Yeah. Very exciting. It is, yes. Once it, again, and it, I'll just review for the sake sure. of whoever yeah. might be listening that a couple of years ago the school committee put in place um, a procedure really whereby all of the international travel requests are due at the same time um, and I think this was a really great plan it allows families to know all of their options um, and for students not maybe to think about oh getting excited about one trip only to find out that their dream trip that they've always wanted to go on came came about a, a month later a month down the road um, as you can see uh, well no it, they don't even run at the same time, so they're they're all over the place. But I think this I think this is our third year, Mrs. Birchman, that we've had this in place where they all come at the same I think time. So it's yeah, real, yeah. I, and it's so been great. Like it. So that's all I wanted to just just give the context. Yeah, Thank and, you, and, Mr. I'll, and I'll go them I'll go through them pretty quickly. That'd be but great. Um, you know, we are excited. We're proposing four uh, international trips for for next school year, 2018, 2019. Uh, all four trips have experienced chaperones that have taken HHS students on travel trips before. Um, we, like Dr. McLeod just mentioned, we did our best to try to spread the trips out. Uh, we have a trip to Costa Rica in uh, February. Um, we have Paris and China trips in the, over the April break, and we have a trip to Athens and Rome over uh, July in the summertime. Um, we, with all four trips, as always, we're working with proven and reliable travel, uh, travel agencies such as EF, Explorica, and the Academic Experiences Abroad, the AEA uh, agency. Um, and again, like I said, we've worked with them in the past before. Um, each trip, as always, will offer uh, some type of fundraising component for uh, to help aid any student that uh, needs help uh, funding the trip. I do think overall, looking at the cost, I think they're, they are reasonably priced given the duration of some of the trips and the locations that we are going to. Um, I think that we've often talked about uh, missing school for these trips, and I know that's something that we take very seriously. And meeting with each one of these chaperones, the, the dates aren't definitive yet. They're still a little bit too far out. Um, but it, it's looking like right now uh, only one trip, that trip to China, potentially would miss uh, that Friday before April vacation. The other trips are all trying to, or at least the two, one in February and the other one in April, are trying to go out on a Saturday to not miss any school. And obviously the trip, the Global Leadership Summit trip in the summer, obviously you're not going to miss any school. Uh, that's our third year taking a trip to the Global Summit uh, with Charlotte Shire, who's a science teacher at the high school. Um, and, and so she's leading that trip, and the topic this year is around the power of communication through social media, which I think is a very timely uh, yeah. topic. Um, but overall, I think we have a nice variation in terms of the subjects that will be hit on, earth science, biology, some art, um, 
uh, nutrition, obviously languages. Um, like I said, the costs I, I do feel are reasonable. I think we have experienced travelers, potentially n not much school being missed for any of these trips. Um, and, and so I think that that is all positives, because um, I know these are the things that we've talked about before, making sure we're mindful of. And, um, and, and I do just want to take a quick sec to publicly thank Catherine McCahill, Shulin Mueller, Erica Wedelo, and, and Charlotte Shire for, for planning uh, and going through this process. It's never easy. It's a tremendous amount of preparation and a lot of responsibility of supporting our students, being able to see different parts of the world. So uh, it's a task that, it, it, like I said, is difficult and one that I really uh, appreciate them taking on. So I just wanted to make sure that I thank them for their work. So thank you. Thank you. If you have any questions on particular trips, I'd, I'd be happy to answer them. Questions? They, they all look like fantastic. I, I, every time it comes up, I feel like we should be offering ourselves as chaperones. I know, I know. Uh, but the trip to China, I know that doesn't happen every year, but does it happen every few years so that every grade would have an opportunity? It does, to yeah. Go so uh, this, we, the last time we went, I believe, if, if this trip goes in 2019, was 2016. So it's every three or four years okay. we try to go. So that yep. every group within every the high school is, is taking yeah, that. Yeah, that's, okay. that's the idea of it. Yep. That's, that's, the, the global leadership one I know is uh, my daughter went on it said it was really life-changing yeah, yeah it's amazing yeah it, it's great you're surrounded by students from all across the, the world and taking on a, a, an interesting topic is always different uh, so uh, I think this is a, a very interesting topic and um, it's always a very popular trip and Miss Shire is a wonderful uh, chaperone and, uh, you know typically that's a trip between anywhere from 12 to 20 students so it's a nice group uh, we'll probably have to get a second chaperone but it, it is a great experience for the kids I loved a lot of the really <clears throat> sort of hands-on opportunities across the board mm -hmm. in that, you know, to go, you have to take a class in French or you have to go haggle in the market in Chinese yeah. or, you know, I just, I think they're really, really rich programs. Um, so thank you. And I appreciate, I did note that you've included the uh, <laughs> disclosure forms for the chaperones. So thank you. Every couple of rounds we add another requirement on the teachers and they're always very accommodating yeah, so we appreciate yeah. that um were there any other questions no they all look all right and your recommendation dr mccarthy just to say that these are the intent to travel and that additional information will be coming your way with much more de or details um in fact the final approvals for this year's trips should should probably be on your next meeting Right. Um, schedule. We're hoping so. Um, yeah, we're just waiting on a few dates for yep, some of them. But so, this yeah. allows um, the organizers to get it out mm -hmm. to parents and to begin to see how much interest there is. So, um, yes, with that said, I'm very excited to recommend all four of these trips. Okay. Great. So I just need a motion. So moved. And a second. Second. You guys are nicely taking turns. <laughs> so that was a motion by Ms. Devlin, a second by Ms. Kavanaugh. All in favor? Yes. Yes. Okay, so that's unanimous. Congratulations. Thank, thank you very much. much. Appreciate it. It's really um, pretty awesome. Yeah, we appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and you're welcome to stay if you'd thank like you. to yes. hear the rest of our meeting, but yep. we don't feel, they don't, feel, <laughs> don't feel obligated. <laughs> <laughs> thank um, thanks for being here. Thank you always. very much. You can sign these whenever. Do you want to take the policies now for a show? And then we'll go back to the mundane reports that we're all stuck here anyway for. Um, Absolutely. Okay. I shouldn't have said mundane. They're very interesting, but we have I'm to sure be here anyway. Yeah. All right. So why don't we then, we're just, all, I'm, I'm going to apologize to the woman that does our minutes because we're all over the place tonight, but um, just to accommodate people who are here and in, in recognition that it's a late night and a long week, why don't we move to school committee policy EHB electronic records retention, which is our first reading. So Mr. Mr. Ghosh is going to here. join us. And Excellent. Sorry to jump nope. in there. Were you ready? Nope. Yep. For me. So while he's getting settled, I'll just give a little bit of uh, background. So we have two policies uh, to take up tonight for the first time, first reading. Uh, these have been shared via listserv. Um, I don't want to jump on to Gene. I know that there was one uh, one person who did um, provide a question yes. um, in response to the listserv, and Jean will obviously share that. Um, but in addition to what you have in your packet, Mr. Ghosh does have, and I think you have also, you have both electronic and paper copy. Mr. Correct, Ghosh. I do. Um, Should I hand those out now? Or in just a second. So just to take up, in addition to what you're reviewing, um, as we know that there's a lot of uh, 
uh, changes that are taking place as it relates to uh, public records and uh, acceptable use, both of these things. Um, so it's, it's um, ever-changing. Mr. Ghosh, as you work through it tonight, does have some additional um, considerations that he will share with all of us. Okay. So with that said, um, I don't know if you wanted to share the public. Um, yes, and it was on the electronic records retention. I did forward it to um, Mr. Ghosh and to you. We just had received a question in uh, from somebody in the community about the three-year requirement in terms of retaining records, and I think you responded that that's the current, and we're making the retention period longer in this policy. That's correct. And, yeah, the and recommendation would be six years at six this point. Six years. Okay. And she was very happy with that answer. So that was the only comment okay. that I received. Yep. And a lot of that, just for background information, that was a recommendation made, you know, last year, obviously, by our legal team. Um, and it's also really what the federal government determines, determines as reasonable. I'm not the, the lawyer, but so we have the right to kind of set that requirement or date based on what our needs are. Great. Thank you. All right. So should we, do you want to walk us through? Sure. Do you want, should we talk about the or current the current changes that are on the yeah on the plan based on some of the things we started last last reading and then I can talk about some of the other additional yeah that's fine and, I, and I'll just confess it's been a bit of time since our last reading so my memory is not as current on okay that. <laughs> yeah maybe I can give a quick review of some of the That'd some of the bigger changes and, and the reasoning behind uh, those be changes um, <clears throat> so I think the the big change you know if we were looking um, at electronic records retention policy I think we were adding initially web history so just as a background information, over the last several years, we started to have equipment um, that was able to kind of keep track of uh, web history uh, as teacher staff or students would browse on the internet, uh, we're able to retain those, those search uh, records uh, over time. And so we thought we'd add that language into the policy and then also define a retention period for how long we would keep that that web, web history. So up in the intro paragraph, you'll see that there's there's uh, web history has been added in front of email, and then it says video, and then audio tape. So that would be the first change, and so web history is exactly that. That's captured in a, in a mobile filter that we have, and we retain it. We'd like to retain it for a suggested 30 days. At that point, it's, it's removed. Can I ask you a question? I'm sure. sure we're speaking. Just to clarify, is that only when they're on Hopkinton Public Schools internet? So if they took a device home that's like part of the so one-to-one. So one. they take a device home, uh, part of the one-to-one, one, there's Chromebooks, those, that web search history would still be captured as well it would, okay. because those are under our um, mobile filter. So there's a mobile filter that goes home on those devices. Okay. And so it's captured. And the same would be for students that are in the uh, lease program at the high school that have the mobile filter on, the same would happen as okay. well. <clears throat> uh, is a... It, maybe this isn't the right, but it, it, any device then used on the internet in this building, it catches like, like if I brought my correct. Okay, just yeah. Curious. So if you if you if you're for example just in not using our, our networks, yeah. then and you're let's say you're connecting with your uh, mobile phone as a hotspot. We have nothing to do with it. It's just through your internet service provider, and we're not dealing with it. If you log into the guest network on that system, it, there's limited access and, and control on that uh, service, but um, we're not really at that point. We don't know who you are as a user, so it's not as trackable necessarily. We can see broad, broadly what people are doing it, but we don't know necessarily who you are as a user. Whereas a student, we create those user accounts. As a staff, we create those user accounts. So when we see a user log in and search, we can associate that user to that web history. So Whereas the, the, the public, we, we can't really. We can see in general what they're searching and can and shut it down if we see that there's something inappropriate, inappropriate yeah. but we don't know names or, or things like that. So for students that are using their own devices instead of leasing through the high school, mm -hmm. you would still be recording all of that because it goes through their student ID. Correct. So they, when they're on our network, they use a, a user ID created by us, and they're logging into our, our official what we call HPS network, which all staff and students are on. And because they're on that school network, we have um, a filter on it as well as, uh, um, you know, devices to kind of protect from malware and spyware and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay. Any Sorry, I interrupted you with. Oh, I know. No, that's a good. It's <laughs> a good question because it's kind of web history can mean a number of things. Um, kind of moving down uh, towards the bottom of the first paragraph, I believe we have employees and then students are urged to refrain from saying things in an email. So because more and more students obviously have um, school email accounts, um, we are encouraging uh, adding that language to kind of teach students to kind of learn how to speak and write appropriately using email communication. Um, so we thought we'd make that public. And then further down, um, some of the changes that we kind of have, um, and I have some on the screen here, but some of the, the changes that are towards the bottom are basically defining web history as being 30 days, video retention uh, being 30 days, and then um, there's also district emails of six years. So we had those three bullets um, that are basically talking about retention periods, um, but Moving forward, that one suggested change I would have once we kind of talk about that is just uh, I've kind of highlighted here and I have some packets if I can show you and talk about it. It puts um, just a little more rationale behind. Do you want to take one of those and pass it down, please? Put some rationale behind the retention periods for each of those uh, and clarify some of that, I think, uh, with legalese um, because I thought it was is important. You know, for example, Specifically, when talking about email retention, so district email, we're looking at retaining those for six years. But we thought we'd highlight the fact that that length of time, an email message must be retained by the district depends on the content and the purpose of the email. If there is a litigation hold or an investigation, that period could change. So we, we thought we'd add that clarifying detail in there. Um, but I'm open to your opinion on it. Um, but it, it helps clarify that. We might hold those emails longer until an investigation is complete. Um, uh, so that language was added at that point. Under web history, I also added the language subject to limited expectations. Web history generally need only be maintained on district servers until its administrative use ceases, and that's currently 30 days. Uh, similarly, we added language under the video um, description. The district must retain all audio, visual, tapes, or digital recordings for a period of at least one month. However, if the recording relates to matters that may lead or result in use of the recording for another purpose, such as an investigation or disciplinary proceeding, the applicable record retention period is adjusted to reflect that new purpose. So again, kind of supporting any legal action that might be uh, underway or any investigations that might be underway. That way it gives us some flexibility and it's not a standard flat 30 day retention period on some of these. Is, is that meant to say exception, expectations or exceptions? Let's see, I'm going the up, web history put my glasses on. Under the video, I'm sorry. No, the I'm web sorry. history, sub subject to limited expectations web history or limited exceptions, exceptions I think. I'll double check. I was I was using recommended language from the legal team, so I can right. kind of yeah, look back at that document and see. Um, it makes more sense to me the other way. But okay. I, I can confirm for you and get back to you. One comment that I had just in general um, about the policy is, I mean, there are a couple of, uh, like, sometimes school committee is, capitalized sometimes it isn't so just those kind of general yeah, editing things but um, more specifically um, I don't know if it's easiest to just put a sentence in the beginning that you know for the purposes of this policy school committee members administration and staff are all considered employees or whatever because there seems like sometimes we we refer to just staff or sometimes we refer to administrators also sometimes there are specific references to school committee mm. and unless that's purposeful which I don't think it is it just seemed a little bit inconsistent and so maybe there's just an easy way to make one statement right up front but I do know you know that our email is subject to um, public record review and obviously is subject to this policy um, and and, and in fact, uh, student records can be as well. Yes, um, exactly. So that, that might be, I noticed that in the next paragraph there where it says staff members and school committee members you might want to add yeah. students or some other language that it's collective. And then, so, so yeah, before you leave that, part, yeah. So if we look at the first paragraph, 
up top. Mm -hmm. okay. Where it says employees and students, right? Right. But then later in paragraph four where you added students, it says staff members, students, and school committee. Mm -hmm. What I'm wondering as I'm listening to Jean is if we add a paragraph up top as you suggested and refer to users. Define what that means. Oh, yeah. And then that, just say throughout the, the it's all policy. The, okay. Yeah, that's a good point. Because all the users. same rules are the same for everybody, right? Yeah. But define some. Yeah, right? users that definitely, I mean, maybe we define it as users within our uh, school network are, are, yep. are on site. And then yep. students using, you know, school devices either at, at home on our on our network. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That is, that is true. And that's then an throughout the language, unless distinguish, a distinct distinguish could be yeah. referring it to it that way. I think that's, that's a, a really yeah, that's a good that's a good suggestion that because um, that makes sense. It, it does. The the policy refers to looking for some so. loopholes for myself. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, there weren't any. <laughs> okay, so define users. Um, uh, okay, thank you for that. And then when people leave the district, their electronic files shall be maintained for three years. But we've increased the other things to six years. Is that? Because yeah. So I would, I would, I would agree that we should probably make, make that six. consistent and continue to keep that for six years to match the email retention period. Where's that, Jean? That's um, right before the long list. I'm looking at this updated one. Oh, okay. okay. All right. No, yeah, right before the red part. Right here. One administrator. Six. for three years so they may be retrieved yeah. if necessary. Yes. Yeah. So that begs an interesting question, which is my files are not hosted on the district server. Or your files aren't. I, like school committee, like we have our own files on our own devices. Devices. Do we, is that something that we need to? I guess it depends on how you classify those files. And are, are those files classified as personal notes? Are those files classified as meaning emails that are on your machine? It gets into the but Google Drive if it's anything we've shared amongst ourselves. Well, our records are all kept. Our official records are all kept very well by Megan and Dr. McLeod. But, yeah, yeah so as long as we don't have to um, – as long as our, our personal files that we might keep – wouldn't have to be part of this. But your notes on the rest of the committee. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to think of a good example. Well, I've so heard in other, other formats. Is that what you're thinking of? Yeah. I mean, I've I have a lot of An example I can think of for myself, and yours would be much, much longer, but when I was taking care of the minutes, right. I used to keep things in my computer that were related to that before I put it into the actual Google Drive, there might be notes that wouldn't be really pertinent to the. So in this, not on the internet. In I mean, in this case, case that I mean, we could decide to either, you know, capture those and save those, or kind of encourage and recommend that you use Google Drive or things that eventually get into Google Drive, um, are ones that are we're going to retain and save. Um, a because we have the resources and the ability to do it within that system, uh, whereas it's much harder to do things that are on your local computers or personal computers. So maybe we, we make a distinction that that if it's in a certain area, those are electronic files that we will retain versus ones that are kept on your local drive and are more personal. Is yeah, I mean, I can't really, I, maybe I shouldn't even raise the question. I was just kind of thinking out loud. I can't really mm -hmm. think of something that I have on my personal computer that would be an official document related to the school committee that isn't also, yeah. uh, you know, that right. you don't have yep. or Megan doesn't have. I can't really imagine most that. Agenda, I'll finalize the agenda minutes. Those yeah. things are all posted. Yeah. All policies are all are kept and stored electronically and posted. Um, all email communications uh, are are through a system that we're, would retain automatically for six years. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe it's not necessary. I was just thinking, you know, the board of selectmen actually the town gives them iPads, I think, or laptops. Oh, I'm not asking for. I won't be re relevant to me anyway. But I wonder if that's to, part of the reason why, if they, a, it's for record retention. Story. Maybe. Um, yeah. I mean, that's one thing I was thinking anyway. At some point, it would make sense to obviously provide, I think, keep thinking of safety and security and just general access. I yeah. mean, it would be probably 
a smart thing to provide school yeah. committee members with a, a device that's yeah. that's kind of protected for special school yeah. use. But we can have well, maybe a deeper conversation about yeah, that. That's, a, that's yeah. a conversation for a different day. But okay, all right. Well, the policy going forward with school committee, like the, the the policy about school committee, maybe that could be something that could be added in there for you know anything that you're, you use Google Drive for that mm. particular process. But again, mm. completely separate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it starts to get, you can go off on many yeah. tangents. Yeah, sorry, I yeah. think I took a stone there's around. A no, of, there's a lot of data, but that's a good thing Mental to think about. Mental note for policy planning. Group. Yes, there we go. Oh, and that's off my plate. Yay. <laughs> um, okay. And should I keep moving down a little bit? So yes, I guess sorry. the recommendation, so initially we had just district email six years, web history 30 days, video 30 days. So I guess my recommendation, and I'm obviously up for feedback and changes to that, would be to strike those lines and keep these lines above it with the, the descriptors under each. So yeah, keeping them each separate with their own unique descriptors under it and then removing these three lines that I think are currently in the edited policy now. Oh, I agree. That's yeah, I think so. I agree. That's a lot more comprehensive. Okay. And those things you just highlighted are all um, recommended by the lawyers that the language the specific yes yeah, so the specific language or descriptor under each of those is exact kind of language from from the, the legal team. from the legal team yeah. and and the duration too that from so to making the changes correct three is, okay, okay and those those are give and take but those are those are based on what's what's applicable to us as a district okay. um, and 30 days is definitely usually a standard number for per video okay um, you know, so you look at what's reasonable and then also what's, you know, fiscally responsible as that far as what, what we can afford <laughs> to keep in yep. store. Yep. Um, and six years is obviously, it's a little easy to do with our, with our Google um, domain. Video starts to get a little more expensive um, because we're storing that locally. Right. That was, I, that was yeah. my next note was, you know, what is, it, what is the cost associated with increasing the duration of retaining okay. this information? And, you know, if it's required by law, it is what it is, but... Okay. Yeah. All right. And then I had one other question. This language is also, um, will it be changed or is it already in the student handbook in some way, shape, or form so that the kids are also aware of sort of the, the level of the big brother point. keeping an eye on what's going the, on in their computers? and These excerpts aren't, but there are, there's some crossover language as, as we'll look when we look at the acceptable use policy next, but we might, we might maybe make that recommendation recommendation to add some of it because uh, some is there and some of the like, components of the acceptable use policy are right in the handbook so i'm sure they're read some of these. very detailed reading of those policies. Yeah. <laughs> but, but just to have it in there so that the yeah, kids are aware of the I, fact I, I that it, that information if you search for something on a school device mm -hmm. that that's yes. going to stay there for a while yeah exactly be aware yes i think that would be a good thing to add to the handbooks if it's not there Um, there's some smaller changes to it. I think there was an extra that in there, so staff should be aware of that, that. There's a double that in there, I believe, so I think that was crossed out. Correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. um, they're subject to the same electronic records, so those are small edits that were made. And then the last major addition um, was this kind of statement that's not on your current, but is, is on, the, on the form that I just handed you. Um, which kind of states the Hopkins Public Schools may disclose uh, education records to cloud-based service providers for the purpose of storing such records on behalf of the school under an exception which allows a district to disclose education records without consent to a contractor to whom the school district has outsourced institutional services or functions. And so the background behind that is to try to kind of notify uh, and make uh, the community aware that we are using services like PowerSchool to store student data and that we have the right to store that data in a service like that without having to notify them because we're required to keep such records for state reporting, to, to be able to automatically sync that data with the state. We wouldn't be able to do that and meet those regulations without having a cloud-based system. Right. So uh, there was some parents that had reached out to me that you know, had some concerns about you know, what, what's the security around that process. and so. Um, that being said, 
this doesn't exempt us from making sure those cloud-based services are secure. So they still have to meet FERPA regulations and requirements. Those systems still have to be secure, um, which they are. Um, but so it's still our responsibility to make sure that they're acting on our, our, our behalf in a safe, safe way. But we don't need to get a consent from the parents before we enroll somebody, for example, in power school. So I don't know if that fits exactly here, but I felt like it was language that I didn't see in any particular policy yep. um, and might help protect us uh, kind of moving forward. That's a good. Yeah, I think that makes so. sense. Yeah, electronic records. Makes, yeah. makes sense, yeah. I think. And then towards at the bottom, I think the last new edit um, is the second to last bullet on the paper form that I handed you was to maintain and update data breach response procedures, um, which isn't kind of in play as far as in any language or any policy that I've seen. I mean, there are a bunch of responsibilities that we have here. Uh, my responsibilities as the tech director to kind of make sure there's procedures in the background to do a variety of things, but I didn't see anything that targeted what happens in, with, a, with a data breach. So if there's an actual data breach, what are the internal procedures to basically notify the people of that breach and what are the processes in place to kind of research what happened and to make sure that's prevented in the future. And so I thought by having language in here that kind of ensures and forces us to do our due diligence and kind of have those procedures in the background and to properly notify people. Um, do we quite qualify under, um, you know, what a traditional business was as far as the data we collect? Not exactly. I mean, I think there's three pieces of information that we're, we're responsible for. For example, a, a person's name, let's say first name, last name, social security number, or financials. We don't, we don't usually collect uh, financial information from parents, and we don't usually have a social security number. So as far as the meeting those three standards in order to be required by state law, we don't necessarily have to do that, but it's, I think, in my opinion, it's a proactive thing to do to have a, some procedures in place when it happens even though we're not collecting people's social security number and financial information. So Thanks. I'll just give some background information on, on that. At a, at a recent conference we were at, there was a number of schools there and some security people were giving um, some talks about it and, and they were asking some basic questions about this and none of the districts really had anything in place for, for data breaches and to notify parents if that happened. So we thought it'd be a good thing to kind of move forward with and put procedures in place. Seems like it'd be better to have it and not need it. Exactly. Correct. Rather than yes. the other way around. I mean, in, in, in reality, have we had a breach yet? No, we haven't. But his, his basic point was it's not a matter of uh, if, it's just a matter of when. So there will at some point be a data breach and that the fact is you have to plan for it and have procedures in place. So those are those procedures are a work in progress at this point. They're not. Quite yeah. So done. I'm yeah. going to work yeah. in coordination with um, our network uh, administrator, um, who's Chapin Porcella. We're going to work with them, and if we need to, we'll work with some other um, contractors to kind of write up the language, have those in place, and we'll be happy to share them with you once they're they're um, ready. I think those are some things we'd probably want to keep. Certain components of it we'd probably want to keep private, um, and. Yeah then we might decide what components we want to make public or not based on some of the procedures. But well, like some of our security. notifications are, are fine. Yeah. yeah, some of the security we don't necessarily want to tell people on all of our safety and security procedures. So whichever portion of it you make public, we do have that procedure, procedure reference in there so we could add that in okay. at a later time. And, um, you know, since it's going back one more time, I'll just say also the punctuation in that section is inconsistent in terms of semicolon and period. Okay. So we can yep. polish that up. Sure. Um, does anybody have anything else? Was it throughout, Jean? Well, I this think it looks like there are a couple that got added at the end that just threw the sequence off. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I see. Mm -hmm. Um. Excellent. Okay, so it sounds like we have a couple of suggestions to get implemented, and I, but I, I would think it could come back next time and we'd be pretty much ready to move forward on this okay. one. Um, so are we ready to move on to...
acceptable use? We are. Okay. Sure. Alright. I'm gonna... This... Um, I don't think there are many, if at all, any changes compared to what was original in your packet. Uh, just in case if you want a paper version. This, okay. I feel bad. This is the most paper I've used. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Carol's gonna I'm over there. See? Hey, that's coming in my way. <laughs> it's yeah, the most paper I've printed in the, the entire year, but I figured with the color, uh, it might help highlight some of the changes, even though I think you have that in your packet. I'll bring this back over for recycling in our okay. printer for tomorrow. All right. <laughs> you can take the staples out. Go ahead and show. Um, okay. So we have, I guess, what makes most sense in this case is we have the original that has been shared through listserv. It doesn't look like there's extensive changes that you've just handed out. I don't think so. In addition to that. No. So or the changes was on the previous policy. Yeah. Right? So why don't we use what you just handed out? Okay. Does that make sense to the committee? I know you've already reviewed the original, uh, the initial changes. So why don't you um, walk us through it, Ashok, including all changes? Okay. Yeah, I mean, the first portion and section, um, we don't have any recommend recommended changes. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the big changes that we were looking at, um, which we had some discussion on the first visit, was the addition of the use of personal hotspots. So that would be an item that um, are, is prohibited used in, um, you know, in school buildings. So the idea of a, a student coming in, uh, they have their cell phone, their cell phone, they, they connect to the internet, and then they connect the computer to their cell phone, and they go out and, and grab the internet without any filtering or any protections within school environment. Uh, so uh, we found that to be somewhat problematic in the school environment. Uh, so we did reach out to see um, you know, last year, um, what the, the liability of doing that was, and, and, and our procedures and the legal team recommended that we had the right to do that uh, if it was something you were in agreement with. Mm -hmm. So that's the first um, explanation is really kind of banning personal hotspot use during the day in school buildings. I'm happy to answer any questions about that. So does this policy also apply to the school committee, to school committee members? I mean, the hotspot piece. Well, I mean, just the whole the whole thing. I think that specifically, and it doesn't even say staff, so I don't. Know if I, we I want didn't mean this hotspots necessarily. I mean, just in the general, the policy, policy. If you know, again, just thinking um, back to the last conversation, if we want to include if, school committee gotcha. for the purposes of this policy, school committee are considered staff. Sure, and, and just as an overview, it, it applies to anybody that would would be using our network. Yeah. So, so any any person, school so community users. use or otherwise, that decides to yep. use our network has to agree to this. A lot of times with the guest the guest procedures, a lot of times you're you're asked to kind of review and sign off on the policy before you're connected. Um, so I'm happy to change language or put language in there that kind of explains that. Okay. More so in the introduction somewhere. Is yeah, and that, that makes it easiest. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. I think the two um, definitions around defining users for both both policies might be the same. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we can work out what that looks like and bring that to you back on the first. And the next kind of recommended changes, we had some discussion last year, but um, we looked at um, ways to kind of update social networking or social media. So that was the biggest, in my opinion, change. And we had some initial conversations, I believe it was last reading, about possible ways to either incorporate social media manuals, procedures, guidelines, 
or depending on what your opinion is, uh, you know, maybe looking at an additional policy for social media. So at, at the moment, the recommendation would, would be to uh, create social media guidelines, uh, which we kind of borrowed and we uh, worked with uh, Cambridge Public Schools. We've been working with them on some of our data privacy stuff. And Steve, the director there, said we're fine to use the, their uh, policy in any way we've seen fit. So we took, we took those, uh, his policy, their policy, and kind of added some Hopkinton language into it. Uh, so there is, I don't know if this link is live, but I do have that. And I don't know if we want to take that in a separate sitting, but there are some social media guidelines that we have uh, a draft of um, that we can discuss as well. So I think the idea was in this particular policy was to remove language that was really specific only to certain social media sites. I think at the time it was developed, there was only things like MySpace, MySpace was in there. <laughs> and so we wanted to make it, uh, you know, all encompassing and, and cover all social media and not just, you know, the main ones at the time. So we try to do that with this language here. Uh, so that's why you'll see under social networking, all staff and students are expected to abide by the social media guidelines as indicated in Hopkinton's social media manual. Um, staff are required to use a Hopkinton email address when establishing social media accounts. That will be used for official school business. So that is, is actually a new, a new line. Uh, we don't really want, as you'll see, staff should not use personal accounts. We really want to prevent staff from using um, personal social media accounts to communicate with, with students for uh, school or business purposes, really. Uh, so we wanted to kind of pull that out. That's also in the guidelines, but we wanted to pull that out and make sure that's part of the policy because I think that's a, a huge guiding factor for staff. Uh, and then under staff will not, we had some initial uh, removals. So that the, the cuts or the strike throughs, those first three bullets, I think were, um, was older language. So I think we made some, some progress uh, at the last reading and kind of added the line, the fourth bullet, use telephone, social media, or other electronic messaging vehicles for contact with students unrelated to school or school-related activities. Um, and then more recently I added this, the, I think it's the fifth bullet, list current students as friends, even though that is kind of relevant to Facebook. Facebook is still obviously um, really popular, so we really don't want um, teachers or staff to kind of list current students as friends on social networking um, sites. If that, and that's just a recommendation, but I'm, I'm happy to discuss that point. Um, still starts to maybe cross the line from what's professional and, and personal. If they're going to do that, it should be on a, uh, you know, a professional uh, school account. Um, I agree with that 100%, but it causes me to reconsider my statement before that I school committee should be staffed yes. just because since we are members of the community, sometimes our friends' kids yeah. friend us. Okay. Um, so Although they wouldn't be our current students. I think we'll have no, to. But they would be with, current students. They no. wouldn't be ours. I think we'll have to go through this policy yeah. um, and, and think about who it relates to in, yeah. in parts yeah. because when I saw this part, I thought this should not just say staff, it should say employees. Yes. Because True. then does that include administration? Like, let's mm -hmm. be right. very clear about who should be included. So, as it relates to this policy, I think we'll have to go through each section of it and recommend who it, who it is right. meant for. Um, and so we will not be able to define the users in a blanket statement at the beginning. Okay. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, this is my nitpickiness, but uh, the second bullet under social networking, you just need a period at the end of the sentence yeah. after business. Okay. Um, and then when it's ready, mm -hmm. obviously the manual should be in the procedure box at the end. Yep. And I think I heard Ashok say, and I think it's a great idea that we bring this back yes. to the social media piece back. So I've added a note to include that, the social media manual as it exists to the next packet yes. for discussion um, as part of taking up this policy next time. Yes, okay. perfect. Social media. Any other feedback or questions on this one? No, I think they're, they're good changes. I think yeah, that you proposed them. Yeah, probably just figuring out who each piece who each right is that pertains to as the big piece. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and I guess that whether we take it up now or at a, a future discussion is really looking at that closely as far as, you know, living in the community, having having family or friends that are you know, students in the community, you know, what, is, what does that look like? I struggle with that as well. So I was, I, it, as Jane was talking, yeah, I was so. imagining it would be, a, could be an issue for any yeah. district employees that live in Huffington. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So if I have an Instagram, a personal Instagram account, right. my daughter's friends want to follow me on Instagram. Well, and it also is, is okay. A, is <laughs> Those well, are the types of things we have to right, get. Right. As a parent, there's a certain level of oversight you want to have of what's going on with your kids and their friends. And yeah. True. Right. That line is. That's tricky. Yeah. Tricky. Yeah. It's but it makes me think, unrelated to policy, that there are. This one in particular, we need to make sure is updated and included in the employee handbook and and that there be sign, some kind of sign-off procedure. I know that we do that in terms of mandated pieces, sure. but um, as we take this up and think about it, we want to make sure that people understand these things clearly because sometimes there can be people who really, as I read this last statement mm -hmm. um, at the top just before the box, the grid. Mm -hmm. um, users who violate district policy or administrative procedure will be subject to suspend, etc. I mean, I think it's just really important that people understand, mm -hmm. um, you know, as we use technology and we depend on it so greatly. Um, we need a period we're responsible for. Yeah, we need a period. <laughs> <laughs> she sees them. You're so, you're they good. just jump out at her. As many as I catch, but they do jump out at me. Um, so we're not going to talk about because we did have this in our packet too. We're not going to talk about the social media guidelines tonight, or we are. So, show the difference between the social media guidelines and the social media manual. We can, we can call it. It's the same thing. So the, gui the, same the guidelines thing? or the manuals in the packet. We can. Oh. Call, I, we can call it whatever. When I saw we, manual, I was it. expecting. Yeah. I thought it was something different. No, it's like. It's in the packet. I think it's, what, it's a page and a half. Yes. yes. Okay. So I'm going to change manual on page two of policy to guidelines, okay? Mm -hmm. Is that what it's called there? Yes. Okay. okay. And no, we should look at it. Okay. Yeah, and I don't know if you want me to read through all of it or. Um, or it's been in the packet. Some of the yeah. So I'm pieces. sure. I think, you know, for starters, I, I would. I had some questions and, and needed some clarity, obviously, from the group about, A, do you want to proceed with this, you know, or at least think about how do, how do we proceed with this? Do you want to proceed as procedures and something we, we have uh, that way, or is it something that could stand alone as a policy, and what are, what are the pros and cons of kind of each of those approaches? Mm -hmm. um, uh, on top of that, it would be great to get some feedback specifically down here around letter D. Um, which kind of uh, hints at social media again as far as um, agreements on file, which was Cambridge's language, but really has to do with our uh, photo restriction practices, right? So, so at, we have to have some conversation about what, is, what does that mean and what does that look like? So what's, what's okay based on our current photo restriction policy and then what does it mean in social media? So, for example, um, if there's no photo restriction for a particular student, a teacher has a, a professional um, Instagram account that they're using with kids. They take a, a picture of that kid and they post it on that social media. Um, that would seem okay, right? And so the gray areas and some of the exceptions are when teachers maybe start to use names, right? We don't want names associated with pictures usually or any other defining personal information ideally so we do our best to prevent that so I just want to make sure that in this section we have language that protects that at the same time what are the exceptions so I think in the photo restriction policy maybe the yearbook is is listed in that policy as a an, an exception as is you know when we look at newspapers if an athlete is getting their photo taken as part of an athletic event it's beyond us, but they could have their picture taken with name and description in that. So do we need to clarify any of that language as it relates to social media or not? And, and I think it would be interesting to hear all of your opinion on that and, and what we need to do. But I just, I think to protect kids, obviously pictures are one thing. If you're saying okay for that, do we want to make sure we remove all the other information, relevant information about those, those kids? 
Social media to me is a little bit different than newspaper okay. for two reasons. One is because it's the district is, in, in this case, presumably if some, somebody on the district's behalf is putting it out there. Okay. So the liability would seem different than a newspaper reporter who has attended something where a student was named and taken the photograph themselves. Okay. But also so to, social media, it's so easy to capture photos for people to steal photos and reuse reuse with the name. I, I don't know if it warrants another. Hmm. I think there's so many so ways to separate. Like, I mean, just as easily on a news website, if yeah. there's if a kid's name and photo are there, you yeah, could just as true, easily right. grab that photo and name. There's probably facial recognition that could do the same thing. And I, it's yeah, it's hard because there are probably things that are going to come up in the next year or two that we are, haven't been invented yet mm. that are going to affect what you have here as well. Um, well so how do you? Do you make a general rule, or do you get specific is kind yeah, of where you're, and, yeah. Or do we want to talk about, and, and it also as we make more exceptions and rules, it also then gets harder to monitor. But I think mm -hmm. the other possibility and suggestion is do we want to look at age or grade level limitations, for example. So as an example, right now currently, um, you know, Class Dojo is kind of this popular thing that can be used in a way um, more locally in a, in a secure environment where you're you're invited as a as a parent into this this group and teacher can post pictures there or things that are going on in the classroom or even can be used for discipline and other things and just that group can kind of see those pictures and it's kind of in a closed environment um, and so do we want to maybe allow more protected closed environments where people are invited in into these social media sites at a younger grade level and maybe open it up more, you know, beyond, let's say, sixth grade or something like that when they're above 13, when there's a lot of automatically rules anyways stating that you shouldn't be, you know, younger than 13 using a lot of these tools anyway. So that's another approach, not to throw, you know, gas on the fire, but that's another approach we could take is we could start to differentiate how maybe social media can be used by staff at a younger level um, and still give them that educational, you know, kind of experience without kind of um, exposing them, if you will, to the greater network. And ultimately it's the parent, I mean, the parents sign off on whether they can have their photo, their name, Correct. any of that information posted mm -hmm. via mm -hmm. social networking sites too, right? That's part of the language. It's not just internet, is it? Or is um, it? The, currently the language in the photo restriction um, is basically is either yes, you're kind of allowing them to be posted to um, school websites, school use, some social media aspect or not, I believe. So it's kind of a yes or no right. um, opportunity. And I think parents have asked, you know, well, what about this? I want, I want a la carte. I want it, I want it for this, but I don't want it for right. that. Right. And the problem we run into is there's hundreds of these sites. And so our permission list becomes this hundred list check off that parents aren't necessarily going to want to It would also seem tackle. difficult for teachers, to, <laughs> if, if it's not just a simple yes or no, right. to be able to pull that up yeah. True. quickly. Do we have an opt-in like that? Or I thought it was, an, you know, you only sign something if you did not want your child's image used. That's correct. It's, it's mostly your, if you don't want it used. But, I mean, the way this is written, it's more that you would have to have an agreement on file. So Correct, that, and that language is kind of coming from Cambridge, yeah, so I think so that's why I highlighted that, because yeah. it doesn't quite fit how oh, we're okay, operating okay. right yeah, now. Yeah, because so I was going to say, that's right. really <clears throat> onerous on you. <laughs> right. Um, Just the number of parents do that. who don't return. Yeah, it's getting Forms. much better. Yeah, I can't well, electronic like, yeah. electronic yeah. process is making it much easier to get the information back. If a parent declines, to, is it through PowerSchool? Currently, yes. Yeah. So they decline through PowerSchool, through the electronic registration process. We can easily search, you know, uh, all the people that have declined, and it's e easy to do. So the, the main office can will know not to put it in a newsletter, for example. A teacher can see it in their list and know. So the process helps a lot. Um, but the difficulty is when you start to break that. A yes or no is, is easy versus like, okay, the class dojo is fine, Twitter's not. Yeah. This is fine. This is not. That becomes unmanageable. Well, and, and you know, and as Jen just pointed out, 
as soon as we make that list, it's going to be outdated. Correct. I mean, I don't. I I think Correct. that's just impossible. That's just chasing your tail. That just seems impossible to me. Um, I, I think you're right. A yes or a no. And so currently, the other language that we have that parents kind of sign off on is that Google Apps permission process, and it's all based on grade level. And those permissions change, but within that, it does talk about using web-based tools or Web 2.0 tools that are applicable that have been vetted by and approved for school use. And they're checking that. So that's another area where they can check. So that has been our other box, what we look at, that says, okay, you can use Google and some of the associated sites, and you're okay with that. Um, and some of those are social media sites. So that's the, uh, that's the current uh, process we have in place to kind of do that. It's the photo restriction and then those permissions for, for web-based tools. Um, and so we're gonna, we're, it's gonna get off track, but I think we're gonna come to a point where we're gonna add a few more things, permissions to that form for next year for re-enrollment processes, but we're trying to limit it. <laughs> so it's, it's, getting, it's getting harder to manage. So to go back to your earlier question in terms of would this be better as a policy or a procedure, I really feel like probably as a procedure okay. just because it changes so quickly and sure. that gives you the flexibility to keep it updated um, as opposed to bringing it back here, going through three readings, putting it out, you know, that's yeah. slow, cumbersome, and onerous. And, um, you know, it certainly is referenced already in our policy, and people looking for materials on this topic will find that on our website. But I think this gives you much greater ability to address an, uh, something that we didn't consider as it pops up as opposed to going through this whole okay. government process. That seems fair. To... So as far as moving forward with procedures, then I should work with Dr. McLeod and kind of clean them up and mm -hmm. kind of have a final draft for you to, to review. And is that something that always becomes public and is open as well to public? Comment yeah, so because it's attached. Or, oh, I see. Well, typically, no, we, we we don't usually send it out. We certainly okay. can. It's not our standard practice okay. to do that. But anything, any procedure that's linked to a policy on our website is usually like a hyperlink, and it go. You know, people can get that document. So to go back to your point earlier about the data breach procedures, mm -hmm. you know, if there are procedures that you don't want to have be public, mm -hmm. then they shouldn't be obviously linked. There should be some sort of modified public version so people have a general understanding but whatever for security reasons that we can't release obviously we wouldn't put it on our own okay. website so <laughs> probably don't have to tell you that but here's where our servers are located and here are all <laughs> here's a map everything you need to know um okay any anything else no i think this is great to yeah, I think this is what really staff have been also looking for, and they've, they've definitely been looking for a little more guidance on the handle certain issues, and I feel like this has been vetted already through Cambridge through a number of processes. The language is pretty easy and clear to understand. It kind of aligns with what we're trying to add to our, our programs here. Um, so I think it will be a relief almost for some teachers to kind of be able to read this and be like, all right, this makes sense. Mm -hmm. That's great. And then I think the opt-in versus the opt-out is something that we'll have to take up and and think about yeah um, I agree. because it just as easy could be opt out as I read it okay. we could change the language around the additional parts that are required um, but but put the onus on the parent to opt out of it as opposed to the way it reads gotcha. it's our responsibility when I would think that parents that that they're aware because it comes every year about the photo yeah, yeah. restriction. And if you really, if you don't want your child's photo used, you're looking for it already. I would think. Mm -hmm. And people absolutely do. Right. I mean, it, right. in and every school, and it's something that's done really well. Yeah. Um, and it's not easy to do. But so, I think those would be the things. What's currently in place? What are the changes? Okay. As we see this, and then um, make it our own. And that's something that that we'll work on. Um, but if I understand correctly from what you said, Jean, that would not necessarily have to slow down the approval no. of the policy. I show. agree. We, okay. could, yeah. we could work on them work on simultaneously, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. But bring this back again on February 1st. Great. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you.
should it seems like you should you understand you have to stay last for the budget your budget presentation too. I think so, yeah. Like you're always oh. yeah. <laughs> no, you, you should get to go first. That's right. I'm, I'm not sure, even sure. here asking for any money tonight. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. I know, we have great. one. <laughs> thanks for letting us put Thank you out of order. Yeah, yeah Thank thanks you for showing. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So let's go back to, or since it's Carol, you could keep going. Do you want to go? Do you want to do that too, since and then we'll go back to reports? <laughs> All right, to sure. Why don't you. we just finish out our new business, yeah. and then we'll go back and do the okay. report. I think so. Um, okay, so Dr. Kavanaugh. Are we on English language learning? Yes, we are. Do I know where I am? Uh, so I am here, again, asking for an additional L teacher in the district, and I know I was here in September doing the same thing. And at the time, I had given to the committee a projected number of English language learners that we thought we would have in the district. And we thought that once we finished our screenings, and at that time we probably mm -hmm. had about 180 kids to screen, we thought, okay, you know, typically once that big influx of students in the fall are all screened, that the numbers aren't fluid anymore. They pretty much stay where they are. But we have seen a different trend this year. So this year we have actually we thought we would get to about 180 kids. We have screened about 215 of them, and there are still 15 kids who are in the queue right now to be screened. There, It just feels like there are always kids in the queue to be screened. We have, since the end of the last school year, picked up 82 English learners, and we have exited 37 from the program. So if you're thinking, how did so many kids get into the program, uh, we have been able to move 37 out. And we've been able to move 37 out because DESE had, at one point earlier in the year, relaxed its standards. So once we got the MCAS scores, if the MCAS scores were high enough, we would be able to move some of the students out. So I believe it was Mina in the fall who said, do you think you'll be able to service this number of kids with the number of teachers you have there. And I said I might be back in January. And, you know, but at the time it would be have been fiscally irresponsible of me to ask for another teacher. But at this point, because we have screened so many students, 215 of them, it takes for a kindergarten kid maybe a half hour. 20 minutes to a half hour for a screening because they're not doing the reading and writing portions, they're just doing the speaking and listening. In January, we rescreen them because now they have the ability to do a little bit more in terms of the screening process. But any student who is not a kindergarten student, the screening takes approximately 70 minutes. So what has been happening is Jill Kimball, our coordinator, just spends all of her time screening and screening and screening when she really should be writing curriculum. But most recently, if you look at those middle school numbers, you would think, oh, there's only 11 kids at the middle school. But four of those students are kids who are foundational. And while we don't do the double teach for our kids at center, because we think if you're a kindergarten or a grade one student, we would never bother to do the, and it technically puts us out of compliance, but it has never posed a problem. So they don't get two periods of instruction a day because they are already in classrooms where they are learning the alphabet, learning to read, learning to, you know, phonics, phonemic awareness, all of those things. So they're getting language while they're in class. But by the time a kid is at middle school, we really do have to give them those two periods a day because they are not going to learn to read, write, speak, and listen sitting in their science class or their social studies class. What we try to do is get them to a place where they can access those texts as quickly as possible. And L service is really the only way to get them there. So when we look at Pilar Wards 11 on that list, and the number today is actually 132, not 130 anymore. Uh, so she's got 11, but Jill is technically also teaching one student at the middle school because that's a student who is foundational and she came into grade six Grade six and grade seven don't have the same schedule, so you can't possibly put the students together. So Jill is back in the classroom as well as screening all of those kids. That's what our coordinator is doing now. The real reason I'm asking for this teacher is not because of the middle school or the high school. I don't mind if the coordinator continues to teach that class you know, 12 hours in, 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 a, in a cycle. Um, but if we look at Chantel and Kate and Heather, the three people who are teaching at the elementary level, Kate hit 32. 
it's really unconscionable for one teacher to have 32 students. That's, that's way too many. Typically, our teachers have you know, 22 students. So Kate is keeping not, not only teaching 32 kids, but keeping the paperwork, with, which for L students is it's pretty onerous, I would say. So they're kind of drowning, Chantel and Kate, at this point in time. And Heather, who has 27 students, has 10 fells, which are former English learners. Suzanne, who is split between two schools, has only 22 students, which is manageable in terms of teaching. But she has 20 fells. So if you scroll down, you can see that paperwork that goes along with what does it mean to be a fell. Every time we do report cards, we have to get information on our former English learners, and they make us do that for four years. So Suzanne Streffling then has to send something out to the fells teacher, and then the teacher will tell us how that student is doing in ELA, math, science, and social studies relative to all those criteria. Suzanne puts that report together, and that report is uh, just kept for documentation to say that it's not like we are losing some of our L's or throwing them out of the program before they are prepared to do that. If you're a middle school or a high school person, you can't just send it to one teacher. You have to send that to four different teachers because in the middle school you have an English teacher, a science teacher, so, and then take all of that data and compile it. So what we are finding now is that between the paperwork and the really high caseloads, um, we really have to bring in another teacher and what we will probably do with that person is put the person into Hopkins where they would have 11 students and 20 fells and then move Suzanne um, oh and the other thing the Hopkins person would do would be pick up some of the kids at center so okay. we would put them in two schools and then Suzanne would move into um, Elmwood and we would balance out the 27 and 11 there that's that's what we're hoping to do Given that it's January 18th and we probably wouldn't get a person in place by the time we post and go through that hiring process till maybe it might be the end of February really before we, that would happen uh, given all that has to happen um, in terms of the posting and the interview process. And it may be very difficult to find someone. When we started in September, I don't think we got Heather into place until probably mid-October. So. It's hard to find people to do this. And the other piece that's important to note is right now we have 11 kids in preschool. We don't serve as preschool kids because by law we don't have to, but they will become ours next year. So even though it says 130 and we know it's 132, I mean, technically there's like 143 kids who really are identified as L's under the, you know, under our umbrella right now. Go ahead. So if I'm reading the whole th thing, I right, it, it looks, well, it actually it reminded me of like a complicated word math problem. <laughs> no. Uh, we had 73 students in September that were identified, and we were now almost double that. Is that, am I reading that right? Um, in, yeah, in September, that current caseload would have been the 47 plus 24, so 34, 36, and 47, yeah, like 83-ish, uh -huh. yeah. So that is it's doubled in six uh, it, that is tremendous in that short period of time to have grown that much. And it is tremendous. It is one thing. And the other thing I really want to commend is the flexibility of the staff to service the kids in the places that they need in different buildings, which I know is not, I'm sure, easy on them. And but it they are working doing really what they hard to do. I mean, that's I. Yeah, when we did the math, we realized we had picked up about 82 kids since, I think, this time last year, but exited the 37. So the net gain from one year to another was 46, and we really only hired one teacher, who is Heather. So, and that was in 46 more students, really. Doesn't seem like we have any other choice. So. I know, it's very <clears throat> difficult right now. Can we pay that teacher? <laughs> no. That was going to be my question. <laughs> so, do we, do we know so why the it is in, it is intentionally not included in the uh, in the memo in terms of the funding source because we wanted to discuss um, a potential source uh, with the town. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I, yeah, I agree. I've said this before, but I think that <laughs> given the 
tremendous amount of unanticipated special education and English language learner costs that continue to impact this year's budget and drain our circuit breaker and, you know, um, put burdens on our staff that we can't physically meet. I think we um, really have to go to the Appropriations Committee and at least ask uh, if, this, if these are expenses that they would consider. Um, covering out from the um, from their reserve fund, I, I think we have to at least ask that question. And if if they don't, we obviously have to find the money. I know um, that's going to be very difficult. But it, do we have a cost? Given that we probably won't hire until sometime mid to end of February, we're really looking at a half year salary. Yeah, I would say. It might even be a little bit less than a half year salary, but we could probably say, I don't know, forty thousand. Okay. Is it some money? Okay. Um, I should add that, and it be, it, because it's obviously relevant when you ask the question, Jen, that we are under a budget freeze right now, um, and this has been a very difficult decision uh, made administratively, and would not be made. Um, because of these very things that we're talking about right now and the requirement or, or the planning that takes to make sure that we have all of our essential services taken care of and our utilities and, and everything else that has to happen to run a school district between now and the end of June, um, you know, we've sent out that, that memorandum to our administrative team um, so that only you know, absolutely what is required to run a program um, is being approved. So not only have we gone through a budget, a difficult next year's budget procedure and process with our administrative team in terms of what they can look forward to next year, um, then they were hit with this. And um, they've been wonderful. They're always wonderful. Is there anything else to add to that, to add more? information around the freeze, Sue, that I left out? No, I think, you know, these are the, the years that you don't want to see um, where, you know, again, it gets to the discussion where we had where there's a lot of transition of, of growth within Hopkinton, and with that comes the, the kids um, need to be serviced where they are. And so that's whether it's special education, whether it's L services, they come and, and the demand for services that are unanticipated are really is what is putting a lot of pressure on, on the budget this year. And the administrators have all been very receptive. They understand it. They've heard it. You know, they understand because obviously it's carrying forward into our next year's budget as well, which is why we see some of these dramatic increases because the students are here and, you know, we need to plan and budget for them for next year. But as it relates to this request, we are already out of compliance, even if we mm -hmm. get this additional request, as are most districts, most districts are. just because of the incredible requirements. Um, at, so that's one thing to consider. But in addition to that, just like with special education, there are requirements, and these students do deserve to have their special, I mean, they, these are special needs in terms of their language needs mm -hmm. met, and even though this additional person will certainly help lessen the load. One of the things that comes to mind, um, in addition to the teaching that, that Dr. Cavanaugh just explained so well in, and in such detail, is the, the amount of paperwork that is required at the state level. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it would be nice for me to say in order for us to be able to maintain our funding source, but guess what? <laughs> in order for us to, to not... <laughs> Whatever. Um, so I think it's important to stress that, that it feels like we're talking about here's a request, we have no money, we've frozen the budget, but we're still making this request because we, we have to. Right. Um, and so I think as we wanted to paint the picture that we would, we've never even had this discussion before yeah. about going to appropriations. No. Well, and I think that, you know, this request meets the standard that you just described in terms of what you said for the budget freeze um, for this year. So I think it's important that we also play by the same rules that we're asking everybody else to play by. But this is, you know, uh, this is an, uh, as you always say, Susan, this is a fixed cost. I mean, we don't have, um, we can't not do this. Um, I'm pretty sure the answer to this question is yes, but this 
position is already included in next year's budget, correct? correct. We did do, do that. So we're just essentially starting earlier because of the, um, the volume. Mm -hmm. So what would be... The motion? Uh, yeah, I mean, I almost feel like we just have to approve the request non-specific to the funding because yeah. I do think we should go through the exercise at a minimum of talking yeah. to the Appropriations Committee, but if they say no, we still have to find this money. Yeah. Um, so uh, is that what? That is what I would recommend, okay. and I think both of my colleagues are nodding. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So I'm just looking for a motion to approve the addition um, of one L teacher. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, okay, so moved. With funding to be, one. do we want to add with the funding to be determined, or did you not want to say that? It doesn't matter, does it? I mean, it can't hurt, right? So, right. with the, with funding to be determined. Okay. Can we move it? <laughs> okay, so, so that was a motion by. Now, yes, now, now it's so moved. Yeah. Oh, okay, Make a motion by Jen and a second by um, Nancy. All in favor? Yes. 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 Okay, well, thank you. Now we'll go back to the beginning of our meeting. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the superintendent's report. Dr. I will McCoy. pass. I was going to say, you're probably going to tell us about the budget freeze. <laughs> so spoiler alert. Um, okay, very good. So um, Dr. Kavanaugh, the assistant superintendent search. Okay, so I have been working with Kim Polnick, and we have set up a few things in moving forward with the assistant superintendent search. So for one, we have um, a posting prepared, so the job description is prepared. It is not really dissimilar from the one um, that we used a couple of years ago that I have responded to in seeking this position. Um, and so additionally, we have put together a timeline, and ideally we would like to post tomorrow and then that would give applicants three weeks to respond to the posting. So the closing date uh, for that would be, um, this is very small to read. <laughs> I think I we said that it would be um, the, I think it's the week of the 12th, sorry. I have this thing and it's just so, so small to look at. Yeah, I can look on my calendar. Yes. I so three weeks that. from tomorrow is the next. Is, is the that 9th? February 9th? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's what it says. Okay. Yeah. Close Same. posting February 9th. Sorry. So then the week of February 5th, sometime during that week, Kim would run her uh, sort of traditional, this is how I instruct the screening committee. Mm -hmm. So even before the posting closes. So then when the posting closes on the 9th, the following week, uh, we would get that um, screening committee together and start some of those initial interviews, the first round of interviews during the week of the 12th. And then we would have to go through February vacation, so then we would work on the central office interviews the week of February 26th. And if we elect to do site visits, that would be the week of March 5th. And then we would uh, do our uh, public forum and school committee visit. Um, Kim is recommending also to do that on the week of March 5th and then make a recommendation to this body during the week of March 12th and hopefully have a school committee vote and an announcement of the elected candidate, um, the chosen candidate by no later than the 18th of March. Okay. I either need new glasses or a bigger screen. <laughs> I, I have to imagine it's pretty well known that we're going to be looking for an assu assistant superintendent <laughs> yeah. Yeah. in the education community. Word, word might yeah. be out, yeah. right? Yes, yeah. true. True. Okay, and do you feel like, um, did Kim say, is this sort of similar timing to what other districts are going through at this point? We feel like we're going to get a good pool of candidates. We do. We think that this is probably a very good time to post. And giving people three weeks is sort of ample time to get their materials together so that they won't feel rushed. Um, and I think part of what might be delaying this is just having that week's vacation. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Does anybody have questions or? No. So the screening committee will be determined at a future so we or have or two weeks have now, right, okay. to get that together. So okay. Kim and I will be working on putting people together on a screening committee as well. Okay. And so this, for anybody that's watching, 
which is unlikely. Um, <laughs> just just as a piece of understanding for people in the community. So unlike the superintendent hiring, which the school committee basically runs and does all of, the assistant superintendent is one that the school committee does hire at the recommendation of the superintendent. And so you really, you, you all lead this process for us. Obviously, we are happy to participate and support all throughout the process as, as um, needed. In the past, we've been on the screening committee or we've gone to the site visits. Certainly, we'll conduct public interviews and we'll be part of the public forums. But just so people understand, on the heels of um, a more a more public, I think, search. Mm -hmm, right. This is this yeah, is how these there's there's mm -hmm. a difference, a distinction. So, um, but I think, and no surprise, that the two of you have this very well worked out. Kim, this is not Kim's first rodeo, no. <laughs> so she has a very good process in place for managing these things. Um, so, yeah. I just add, just because you've called, you know, indicated, just in case people are interested, that in this case, I'll just make the distinction that the recommendation will come from the superintendent elect. Okay. Um, because it's really important that Dr. Kavanaugh run this search and that it be her recommendation, obviously. This is an unusual kind of situation, yeah. uh, but, but obviously she's running the search for her replacement it, because she's going to be the superintendent. So um, it will be important that this be her recommendation. Well, and thank you. That's, okay. that's, that is, um, that's generous of you, and I think the right really? decision for the district yeah. and certainly for Dr. Kavanaugh. So, um, Excellent. Well, thank you. Are we ready? Email you a copy of that time. Oh, thank you, because so I won't remember all of that. Okay. Um, so moving on to the school committee chair report, I did already review the one piece of um, public comment that I received this week, and then in addition to that, I have approved warrants for payment for the accounts payable warrants number. 18-042, number 18-043, number 18-044, and number 18-045. The warrants have been included in your packet. I have also approved for payment the payroll warrant S18014, and the warrant has been included in your packet. Um, and at, at our meeting on January 11th, the school committee voted to approve the executive session minutes of October 19, 2017, and to release them as redacted. Um, so that is all for my report. Do we have any liaison reports? I have a short one. I don't want to mess with your time. No, yeah, we're, we're, we're really good. We're still on track here. Um, the elementary school building committee met, and um, there was actually lots of good news, I feel like, that came out of that meeting. Um, and Susan was there, too, and I think, I mean, I'm a, that was good news, right? I, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm trying to get a read. Um, so a couple good things. Um, the playground and play spaces for pre-K and for K-1 are, are in the works, which is kind of, you know great news for um, all the students and the staff at that school. Let them play. <laughs> get the energy out, right? Um, but I think that something that came up that was really um, great is that the committee um, approved the uh, budgets for tech and for... Um, FF&E furniture and furniture equipment. Furniture and equipment. Okay. equipment. Thank you. Um, and and so um, <laughs> you know, last week or la sorry, last week, last meeting was it last week? <laughs> yes. Whatever it was that um, Lauren and Ashok were presenting their sort of cut, cut, cut version. Um, what was really interesting is that the committee saw this cut, cut, cut version and basically came back with a do you think you did cut too much? And I think all of us kind of got a little almost, I don't think defensive is maybe the right word, but we were like, yeah, we can't go anymore. This is as, as low as we can go. And they're like, no, 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 that's not what we're asking you. Did you go too low? Do you need money back? And so it was kind of a good conversation because they recognized that, that both Lauren and Ashok really just went as bare bones as they could. And I think the committee didn't, wasn't, willing to accept bare bones. They, they wanted to make sure that there was enough to really make um, the, the opening of the new school and all the students, you know, make it as good as it possibly could be w under the constraints of, of all the budget situations that we have going on. So anyway, um, so they, they were very 
gracious with um, a contingency budget and, and um, they put to get just in case for technology um, because um, it hasn't gone out to bid yet. And so anyway, I feel like when we walked out of there, we were like, did they just give us back? <laughs> like it was a very, I didn't, you know, I, I'm new, so I don't know how this works, but it seemed like, yeah, it seemed one. like that's not the trend over the last several meetings and all of a sudden yeah. they were starting to say, wait, 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 you cut too much. So I think that was great because I think that both of them, you know, did everything that they could to, to get as, to get things down as low as possible. And, and when you start taking stuff away, you realize, you know, so how much more you could do if you had access to just a little bit more and the committee recognized that and said, okay, so, you know, we'll, we'll work with you. So it was, it was nice. Um, and um, the other piece that came out is that they reported that it kind of looks like a school now. I haven't been in oh. in a long time. Have you? Yeah, so, have, so maybe you, someone else can speak better to we this. We should go over. But it's the model classroom Yes, they said you walk in and you feel, he said if when you walk in it feel like the building essentially feels like a school yeah. it's not just the classroom itself but the building and i haven't seen it so i can't speak lauren to has set up tours for all given the teachers all of their assignments oh so exciting all of their they classrooms assignments and she has set up tours for oh, tomorrow monday. monday i thought monday okay yeah i mean uh, maybe there are two days maybe because the teacher we spoke to said monday for them to go mm -hmm. and uh you know with their groups and i thought you know in true Lauren style, how thoughtful of her to have gone to the trouble of letting them know what their room would be, just as re as instead of just going to the building and seeing it and being excited about that, they get to think, oh, this is where I'm going to be, and right. just uh, awesome. so it's very it's very exciting. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. That is exciting. Mm -hmm. So that was a little bright light in the darker yeah, budget here. scene. Yeah, exactly. So I do. I have uh, CPAC met on Tuesday. We had a presentation from Mr. Bishop, as well as the guidance on uh, Department on Transition Planning, which, as we know from when the school committee was met with CPAC in the spring, has been a challenge for the um, school to meet in a way that feels good to everybody. So yeah. it's it's an ongoing work in progress, uh, and I think presentation was well received mm -hmm. also dr. Kavanaugh presented um, on literacy it, it uh, very well obviously put together and planning forward for a longer literacy conversation in March great and I will give a budget update um, so we did submit our budget after we voted it at our last meeting and I was able to watch the Board of Selectmen meeting on Tuesday um, where they discussed um, the budget and it's no surprise to any of us to hear that the town is having a very very challenging um, budget season this year so as we had discussed at our meetings so they discussed at theirs having a larger meeting with um, the school committee the Board of Selectmen, it's my hope that the Appropriations Committee would be included in that and probably also the Capital Improvements Committee should be, be discussing capital articles at the same time. Um, so at any rate, they certainly received that message. They, um, you know, the conversation was very much that they understood that we voted our budget to move it forward to meet the deadline, but we understood that we needed all to work together um, on this budget. So just wanted to, to reiterate that, that they have also started um, their process and and I believe that the the way the conversation ended was that Mr. Kamala would be reaching out to Dr. McLeod to set up um, a joint meeting at some point so look for an invitation in your she in your I have a meeting with him on Monday well, we'll so that maybe we'll, we'll we'll get our calendars out yeah very good okay. um, so if there are no other liaison reports uh, we have no old business. I think we checked off everything on the new business. Mm -hmm. So we actually are at the opportunity, our second opportunity for public comment. Although all members of the public have <laughs> gone home by this point. So without further ado, we are, we are at items by consensus. Is there anything that anybody would like to move out separately for consideration? Okay, I will turn it over to you, Dr. McLeod. The superintendent recommends the school committee move to approve the items by consensus as outlined below. So moved. And a second? I'll second. Okay, so a motion by Ms. Kavanaugh, a second by Ms. Devlin. All in favor? Yes. Yes. Okay, and I'm a yes, so that's unanimous. 
And uh, we are ready to adjourn at 9.34. I just need a motion. So moved. And a second. Second. And all in favor? Yes. Yes. And so that is unanimous. We will return here on February 1st at 7 o'clock for our next regular meeting. Thank you very much to HCAM, and thank you, and good night. Good night.